Oh, you. Scazy's men are arrogant and ill-mannered. And as for Weber, the man is a thief and a killer. Four times in the last month, men who have won large amounts of money have been slain close to his establishment. And he killed two others in gun battles over alleged cheating. It is insufferable, sir. Then do something about it, advised Shanna. Well, that's what we are doing, put in Fenner, a dark-eyed young man of slender build. We have come to you. You do not need me. Get together twenty men. Go to Weber. Close him down. Order him from the community. His, his men are thugs and villains, said Brisley, wiping the sweat from his face. They thrive on violence. We are merchants. You have guns, said Shano simply. Even a merchant can pull a trigger. With respect, sir, Fenner interposed, it, it takes a certain kind of man to be able to kill a human being in cold blood. Now, I, I, I don't know if killing will be necessary, I hope not, but surely a man with your reputation would find it more easy to stamp his authority on the villains? In cold blood, Mynheer, responded Shanno. I do not consider it in those terms. I am not a wanton slayer, nor am I a kind of respectable brigand. Mostly the men I have killed have died in the act of trying to kill me. The rest have been in the process of willfully attacking others. However, such points are meaningless in the current circumstances. I have no wish to give birth again to seven devils. You have me a loss, sir, said Fenner. Read your Bible, Mynheer. Now leave me in peace. Shano finished his drink and returned to his room. For a while he sat thinking about the problems posed by the wall, but Beth McAdam's face kept appearing before his mind's eye. You're a fool, Shano, he told himself. Loving Donna Tabard had been a mistake, and one he had come to regret. But it was folly of the worst kind to allow another woman to enter his heart. He forced her from his mind and took up his Bible, leafing through to the Gospel of Matthew. When an evil spirit goes out of a man, it goes through arid places, seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. How often had the Jerusalem man seen the truth of that? In Alien, Cantaste, Bicalin, and a score of other settlements, the brigands had fled before him, or been buried because of him. Then he had ridden on, and the evil had returned. Daniel Cade had visited Allian two weeks after Shano left, and the town had been ruined by his attack. It would not happen here, he decided. In Pilgrim's Valley, the Jerusalem man was merely an observer. Chapter 15 the pistol competition had left Shano short of shells for his Hellborn pistols. There were twenty-three left, including the ten in the cylinders of his guns. Pilgrim's Valley boasted one gunsmith, and Shano made his way to the man's small shop in the eastern section. It was a narrow building, lit by lanterns, the wall behind the service area filled with weapons of every kind, from flintlock pistols to percussion rifles— flare-barreled blunderbusses, alongside sleek, gravity-fed weapons with walnut stocks. But there were no pistols like Shano's. The shop owner was a short, bald, elderly man who identified himself as Groves. Shano drew one of his guns and laid it on the double-plank unit that served as a long table between the gunsmith and his customers. Groves sniffed, and lifted the weapon, flicking open the gate and ejecting a shell. Hellborn, he said. Oh, there are a lot of these in the north now. 
were hoping to get some, but they're mighty expensive. I need bullets for it, said Shannon. Can you make them? Would have no trouble with the moulds or the fulminates, but these brass cases, ooh, do not be easy, Mr. Shano, nor cheap, but you can do it. Leave me five shells with which to experiment. I'll do where I can. When you're leaving? I was due to ride on today. Groves chuckled. <laughs> I need at least a week, sir. How many do you require? One hundred would suffice. Ooh, that'll cost fifty barters. <laughs> I would appreciate half now. Your price is very high. Oh, so is the level of me craftsmanship. Shannon paid the man and returned to the hotel, where he found Mason sitting in a comfort chair by an open window, dozing in the sun. I need the room for another week, he said. Mason blinked and stood. I thought you were moving on, Mania Shano. I am, sir, but not for a week. I see. Very well. A week, then. Shano walked to the stable and saddled a stallion. The hostler grinned at him as he rode out, and Shano waved as he steered the horse to the south, heading for the wall. He rode for two hours, crossing rich grassland and cutting high into the timberline of the hills. He saw cattle grazing and a herd of antelope moving along the line of a stream. The wall grew ever nearer. From the high ground where he rode, Shano could see over the colossal structure and the rolling hills beyond it. There was no sign of life, no cattle, sheep, goats, or deer. Yet the land looked rich and verdant. Angling the stallion downwards, he halted on the hillside, drawing his long glass from the saddlebag. He followed the line of the wall, first to the east, where it disappeared in the blue haze of the mountains. Then he swung the glass west. As far as he could see, the wall went on for miles, unbroken and unbreachable. He focused the glass on a section of it some half a mile away, and saw a group of men camped nearby. Then he continued his descent and rode on. The wall now reared above him, and he estimated its height at more than sixty feet. It was constructed of giant rectangular blocks, each approximately ten feet wide and more than six feet high. Shano dismounted and approached the edifice. He drew his hunting knife and tried to push the blade between two stones, but the fit was too tight, and there was no sign of mortar. From the hill above he judged the wall to be at least ten feet thick. He sheathed his knife and ran his fingers over the blocks, seeking handholds that might permit him to climb. But apart from lichens and curious shells embedded in the surface, there was no purchase. He stepped into the saddle and followed the line of the wall west until he reached the campsite, where Boris Heimat was chipping away at one of the blocks with a hammer and chisel. The scholar put down his tools and waved. "'Fascinating, is it not?' said Heimat, grinning cheerfully. Shano dismounted, his eyes scanning the small group of men who continued with their work. To the far right he could see the two men who tried to force him to leave the site of the shipwreck. They avoided his gaze and continued to chip away at the blocks. Shano followed Heimat to the campsite, where a large pot of bakers was brewing. Heimat wrapped a cloth around the handle and lifted the pot, filling two mugs. He passed one to Shano. "'Have you ever seen anything like it?' asked Heimat, and Shano shook his head. "'Nisa have I. <laughs> there are no windows, no towers, and no gates. It could not have been built for defence. Any invading army would simply throw grappling lines over the top and climb it. There are no parapets, nothing, just a colossal wall. Take a look at this. He fished in his pocket and produced a shining shell, slightly larger than a barter coin. Shano took it, turning it over and holding it to the light. There were many colours glistening within the grooves, purple, yellow, blue, and white. It is very pretty, Shano said. Indeed it is. 
but it is also from the sea, Mr. Shano. This towering structure was once below the ocean. This whole land was once under water, Shano told him. There was a civilization here, a great civilization, but the seas rose up and devoured them. So then you are saying this is an old world site? No. The old world sites are now mostly beneath the seas. I learned several years ago that the earth had toppled not once, but twice. The people who lived beyond this wall were destroyed thousands of years ago. I have no way of knowing, but I would guess it happened about the time of the flood described in the book. How do you know all this? asked Heimat. Shano considered telling him the whole truth, but dismissed the thought. What credibility he had would disappear if he explained how the long-dead king of Atlantis had come to his rescue in the battle against the Guardians during the Hellborn War. Two years ago, with a friend, I rode into the ruins of a great city. There were statues everywhere, beautifully carved. While there, I met a scholar named Samuel Archer. He was a fine man, strong yet gentle. He had studied the ruins and others like them for many years, and had even managed to decipher the language of the ancients. The city was called Balacris. The land was known as Atlantis. I learned much from him before he died. I am sorry that he is dead. <laughs> I would like to have met him, said Heinrich. I, too, have seen the inscriptions on gold foil. But to meet a man who could read them, how did he die? He was beaten to death because he would not work as a slave in a silver mine. Hymant looked away and sipped his bakers. Oh, this is not a contented world, Meneer Shano. We live in strange circumstances, fighting over scraps of knowledge. Everywhere there are isolated communities and no central focus. In the wild lands the brigands rule, and in settled communities there are wars with rivals. There is no peace. Oh, it is most galling. Far to the east there is a land where women are not allowed to show their faces in public, and men who deny the book are burned alive. To the north there are communities where child sacrifice has become the norm. Last year I visited an area where women are not allowed to marry. They are owned by the men and used as breed cows for the community. But wherever you go there is violence and death and the rule of the powerful. Have you been to Rivervale? I have, replied Shanna. I lived there once. Now that is an oasis. It is ruled by a man named Daniel Cade. They have laws there, good laws, and families can raise their children in peace and prosperity. Oh, if only we could all find such a way. You say you live there. Uh, do you know uh, Daniel Cade? I know him, said Shanna. He is my brother. Good Lord, I never knew that. I have heard of you, of course, but no one ever spoke of a brother. We were parted as children. Tell me, what do you hope to achieve here? Uh, Minias Gezi is looking for a way to breach the wall. He has asked me to examine it, and I need the coin in order to be able to return home. <laughs> I thought you disapproved of him. I do. He is... <laughs> Like all men who seek power, eminently selfish. But I cannot afford too many scruples, and I harm no one by examining this edifice. Shano finished his drink and rose. Will you stay the night, Minia? Hymet asked. It would be good to have some intelligent conversation. Thank you, no. Another time, perhaps. Tell me... What do you know of Skazy? 
Hanan shrugged. Oh, very little. He came here a year ago with a great deal of coin and a large herd of cattle. He is said to be from the far north. He is a clever man. I don't doubt that, said Shanna. Shanna returned to the settlement just before dusk. He left the stallion at the stable, paid the hostler to groom and feed him, and then walked to the jolly pilgrim. Beth McAdam smiled as he entered and moved across to greet him. I haven't seen much of you, Shano, she said. Food not good enough. The food is fine. How are you faring? I oh, can't complain. You? Well enough, Shano replied, aware of a rising tension. Would you bring me some food? Anything hot that you have? Sure, she told him. He sat quietly facing the door and glanced around the room. There were eight other diners. They studiously avoided looking at him. Beth brought him a bowl of thick broth and some dark bread and cheese. He ate it slowly and considered ordering bakers, but then he remembered Heimat's warning about the drink being habit-forming and decided against. Instead, he asked for a glass of water. Are you all right, Shano? asked Beth as she brought it to his table. You seem a little, uh, preoccupied. I've been studying the wall, he told her, looking for a way through. It looks as if I will have to climb it and proceed on foot. I do not like travelling that way. Then ride around it. It cannot stretch across the world, for goodness sake. I could take weeks. And you, of course, are a man with no time on his hands. He grinned at her. <laughs> Will you join me? I can't. I'm working. But tomorrow morning I get a free hour at noon. You could come then. Perhaps I will, he said. Maybe, if you do, you should consider getting that coat brushed, hmm? And cleaning your other clothes. You smell of dust and horses, and that silver forked beard makes you look like Methuselah. Shano scratched his chin and smiled. <laughs> we will see. Just then, Elaine Fenner entered. He spotted Shano and approached. May I sit down, Minier? he asked. I thought we had concluded our conversation, said Shano, annoyed that the interruption caused Beth to leave. It is only a voice I am seeking. Shano gestured to the chair opposite. How can I help you? Fenner leaned forward, lowering his voice. We are going to close down Weber tonight. As you suggested, there will be a group of us, Brisley, Broom, and a few others. But we are none of us men used to sudden violence. I would appreciate your thoughts. Shano looked into the man's open, honest face and realized that he liked him. Fenner had courage, and he cared. Who will be your spokesman? he asked. I will. Then it is you the ungodly will look to for action. Do not allow Weber or anyone else to take the lead. Do not enter into any discussion. Say what you want and make it happen. Do you understand me? I, I, I think so. Keep all talk to a minimum. Move in, get Weber out, and close the place. If there is the least suggestion of opposition, Shoot someone. Keep the mob off balance. But it is Weber you must control. He is the head of the snake. Cut him off, and the others will stand and wonder what to do. And while they are wondering, you will have won. Can you trust the men with you? Tr trust them? What do you mean? Are they close-mouthed? Will Weber know of your plan before you arrive? I don't think so. I hope you're right. Your life depends on it. Are you married? I have a wife and four sons. <laughs> Think of them, Fenner, when you walk in. If you make a mistake, it is they who will pay for it. Can it be done without shooting anyone? Perhaps. I did not say you should walk in with guns blazing. I am trying to tell you how to stay alive. If Weber starts to talk and you respond, his men will begin to gather themselves and your men will start to waver. Be strong, be swift, and be direct. No shades of grey, Minia Fenner, black and white, win or lose, live or die. 
Fenner took a deep breath. I will try to follow your advice. Thank you for your time. It costs me nothing. If trouble starts, or even looks like starting, kill Weber. But Shano knew he would not, for even as he said it, the young man's eyes wavered from his direct gaze. Do your best, Mania. When the young man had left, Beth returned to the table. He's a good man, she said. He may not live very long, Shano told her. There were eight armed men in the group that entered Weber's gambling house. It was crowded with more than twenty tables and a long bar packed with customers. Weber himself sat at a Carnat table to the rear, and Fenner led the group through to him. "'You will come with us, Mynheer Weber,' he said, drawing his pistol and pointing it at the gambler. As the revellers realised what was happening, a silence fell on the room. Weber stood and folded his arms. He was a tall man, running to fat, but powerfully built. His eyes were black and deep-set, and he smiled at Fenner. Gleaming gold flashed in his grin, and Fenner saw that the teeth on either side of his incisors were moulded from precious metal. Why, in the devil's name, should I? Weber asked. Fenner cocked the pistol. Because you'll be dead if you don't, he told him. Is this fair? Weber thundered. What have I done? I run a gambling house. I have killed no one, save in fair battle. You are a thief and a scoundrel, said Josiah Broom, pushing forward, and we are closing you down. "'Who says I am a thief? Let him stand forward!' Weber shouted. Fenner waved Broom back, but the man pushed on. "'People who win from you are killed. Do you deny any responsibility?' "'Why is that my fault, Mynheer? A man who wins a great deal of coin is seen by many other unluckier gamblers.' Fenner glanced around. The crowd had fallen back now, and Weber's men ringed the group. Brisley was sweating heavily, and two of the others were shifting uneasily. Fenner's pistol leveled at Weber's chest. You will move now, Minir, or suffer the consequences. You would shoot me down. Murder me, Minir. What sort of law is this you are proposing? He, he's right, Elaine, whispered Broom. We didn't come here to kill anyone, but let this be a lesson to you, Weber. We'll not stand for any more violence. I stand and quake in my shoes, Mynheer Bacon Server. Now, all of you put down your weapons, or my men will blow you into tiny pieces. Brisley's gun clattered to the floor, and the others followed, all save Elaine Fenner. His eyes locked to Weber's, and understanding flowed between them. But Fenner was no killer. He uncocked the pistol and thrust it deep into the scabbard at his hip. But as he did so, Weber drew his own pistol and shot Fenner twice in the chest. The young man scrabbled for his gun and fell to his knees, but a third shot struck his breastbone and spun him back to the floor. Emily, he whispered. Blood bubbled from his lips and his body twitched. Get the fool out of here ordered Weber, as a game in progress. Brisley and the others hauled Fenner out into the street and back past the traveller's rest. Shano was sitting on the porch. A great sadness weighed down on him as he stood and walked to the group. He just shot him down, said Broom. Elaine was putting away his gun, and Weber just shot him down. Shano leaned over and touched his hand to Fenner's neck. He's dead. Put him down. Not in the street, Broom protested. Put him down, stormed Shano, and wait here. He took off his coat and left it by the body, then walked swiftly to Weber's establishment. He entered and stalked across the room where the gambler was drinking and joking with his men. Then he drew his pistol, cocked it, and slid it against Weber's lips. "'Open your mouth,' said Shano. Weber blinked twice and saw the light of fury in Shano's eyes. He opened his mouth and the barrel slid between his teeth. "'Now stand.' Weber eased himself to his feet. 
Shanna walked him slowly back through the throng and out of the door into the street. He did not need to look back to know that everyone in the gambling house had followed. Word spread to other establishments, and the crowd grew. Weber backed away, the gun almost making him choke. His own pistol was still in its holster, but he kept his hands well away from it. Shano halted by the body of Elaine Fenner and turned slightly to look at the crowd. This young man risked his life for many of you. And now he lies dead, and his wife is a widow, and his sons have been robbed of a father. And why? Because you have no courage. Because you allow the vermin to walk among you. This man died as a result of sin. His eyes swept the crowd, and as the book says, the wages of sin is death. Shano pulled the trigger. Weber's brains mushroomed from his skull, and the body fell back to the earth with dark powder smoke streaming from the blackened mouth. Now you listen to me, Shano roared into the stunned silence that followed. I know many of you brigands. If you are in Pilgrim's Valley come morning, I will hunt you down and kill you on sight. You may be sitting breaking your fast, or sleeping snug in a warm bed, or quietly playing Karnat with friends, but I will fall upon you with the wrath of God. Those with ears to hear, let them understand. Tomorrow you die. A stocky man stepped from the crowd, wearing two guns thrust into his belt. You think you can tackle all of us? he challenged. Shano's pistol boomed, and the man flew from his feet, his skull smashed. There will be no questions, declared the Jerusalem man. Tomorrow I will hunt you down. Chapter 16 The long night had begun. Shano sat in his room with his hellborn pistols on the table beside him, his trusted cap-and-ball weapons in the scabbards at his side. He cleaned the old guns and reloaded them. He had only sixteen shells for the hellborn revolvers, and if the night turned sour, he would need more than that. He moved his chair away from the window and now sat in the darkness of his room. The pillows of his bed had been rolled tight and placed under the blankets to imitate a sleeping form, and now the Jerusalem man had nothing to do but wait for the inevitable. As the first hour crept by, he heard the sound of horsemen leaving the town. He did not look from the window to check the numbers. At least two-thirds of the brigands would be leaving before dawn, but it was not the runners who worried Shano. He sat in the darkness, his fury gone, blaming himself for Fenner's death. He'd known deep in his soul that the young man could not survive, and yet he let him walk into the valley of the shadow. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer should have been yes. He recalled the shocked looks on the faces of the mob as he had blown Weber to hell, and he knew what they had seen. The crazed fanatic, the world knew as the Jerusalem man taking one more helpless victim. They would forget that Weber had mercilessly murdered poor Alain Fenner, but they would remember the tormented Weber standing in the moonlight with a pistol barrel in his mouth. And so would Shano. It was not a good deed. He could convince himself of its necessity, but not of its virtue. There was a time when John Shano would have fought Weber man to man, upright and fearless. But not now. His powers and his speed were waning. He'd seen that well enough when he watched Clem Steiner shoot the jug. Once, maybe, the Jerusalem man could have duplicated such a feat. Not any more. Not even close. A floorboard creaked in the corridor outside. Shano hefted a pistol, then heard a door open and close, and the sound of a man sitting down on a mattress. He relaxed, but left the pistol cocked. Rivervale. That was where his life had changed. He'd ridden through the wild lands and found himself in a predominantly peaceful community. There he had met Donna Tabard. Her husband, Thomas the Carpenter, had been murdered, and she herself was under threat. Shano had helped her and had grown to love her. 
Together they had journeyed with Con Griffin to a hoped-for new life in a world without brigands and killers. Griffin had called it Avalon. Yet what had they found? Shano had been wounded by the Khans, a strange race of cannibals, and rescued by the saintly Caritas, a survivor of the fall of the world. Donna had believed Shano dead, and had married Griffin. And something in John Shano had given up the ghost and died. He remembered his father once saying, "'Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all.' But it was not true. He had been more content before he met Donna. Perhaps not happy, but he knew who he was and what he was. The soft scuff of a boot sounded on the roof above his head. "'Come then, my would-be killers. I am here. I am waiting.' He heard the stretching groan of a rope and saw a booted foot in a loop easing down outside the window. Lower and lower it came until a man's body appeared. He was holding the rope with his left hand while in his right was a long-barreled pistol. As his torso came level with the window, he sighted on the bed and fired twice. At the same time, the door to Shano's room was smashed open and two men rushed in. The Jerusalem man shot them both with his left-hand pistol, then twisted his right and fired point-blank into the belly of the man on the rope, who screamed and pitched back out of sight. Shano lifted his pistols high and blasted three shots through the ceiling. He heard a man yell, the rope sailed past the window, and he heard the thumping crash of the body splitting the planks of the sidewalk. Silence fell. The room stank of gunfire, and a fine mist of powder and cordite hung in the air. Outside in the corridor, Shano could hear whispered commands, but there was no movement. Swiftly he reloaded his pistols with the last of his shells. Two shots came from the corridor. A man screamed, and a body thudded against the wooden landing. "'Hey! Shano!' called Steiner. "'It's clear out here. Can I come in?' "'Your hands better be empty,' Shano replied. Steiner stepped across the bodies and entered the room. "'There were only two of them,' he said, smiling. "'Damn it, you do make life interesting. "'You know, at least thirty men have already left the settlement. "'What I wouldn't give for a reputation like yours.' "'Why did you help me?' "'Hell, Shano, I couldn't take the risk of someone else killing you. "'Where in the world would I find an opponent like you?' risk. Steiner eased his way to the side of the window and pulled the thick curtain across it. Then he struck a match and lit the lantern on the table. Uh, mind if I move these bodies into the hall? They're starting to stink up the place. Without waiting for a response, he moved over to the corpses. Both shot through the head. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty damn good. He grabbed the collar of the first man and dragged him out into the hall. Shano sat and watched as he pulled the second corpse after it. "'Hey, my son!' Steiner shouted. "'Can you get some men up here to move this dead mate?' Stepping back inside, he wedged the broken door shut and returned to his seat. "'Well, Shano, you gonna thank me or what?' "'Why should I thank you?' "'For taking out the two on the stairs. "'What would you done without me? "'They had you trapped in here like snared game.' Thank you, said Shano. I know you should leave. I'm going to get some sleep. You want me to walk with you tomorrow, when the hunt starts? That will not be necessary. Man, you are crazy. There's still twenty, maybe thirty men who won't be run out. You can't take them all. Good night, Mania Steiner. The following morning, after three hours' sleep, John Shano made his way down to the lobby and called Mason to him. Send somewhere out to find me six children who can read. Have them brought here. Then the Jerusalem man sat down at a table with six large sheets of paper and a charcoal stub. Slowly and carefully he spelled out a simple message on each sheet. Shano made the children read aloud the message, and then sent them to the gambling and drinking houses in the east section, with instructions to hand a notice to each of the owners or barmen. The message was simple. Warning. 
anyone carrying a gun within the township of Pilgrim's Valley will be considered a brigand and a war-maker, and will be dealt with as such. Shanno. When the children had left, Shanno sat back and waited patiently, emptying his mind of fear and tension. Mason brought him a cup of bakers and sat down opposite. For what it's worth, Shanno, the room is free, and any food or drink you consume. That is kind of you, Mania. Mason shrugged. You are a good man. This will make you no friends, however. I'm aware of that. He looked into the man's cadaverous face. I do not think you were always a roomkeeper. Mason gave a thin smile. You chased me out of Allian, put a bullet in my shoulder. <laughs> when it rains, it hurts like the devil. Shano nodded. I remember you. You rode with Cade. I'm glad you found something more productive. A man gets older, said Mason. Most of us took to the road because we were forced from our farms, either by raiders or drought, or men with more power. But it's no life. Here I have a wife, two daughters, and a roof over my head. My meals are regular, and in the winter I have a large log fire to keep out the cold. What more can a man rightly ask for? Amen to that, Shano agreed. What will you do now? I'll wait until noon and then root out whoever is left. This isn't Alien, Shano. There you had townspeople who backed you. There was a committee, I recall, all good with rifles, and they protected you back. Here it is suicidal. They will wait for you in alleys or shoot you as you appear on the street. I've spoken the words, Mania, and they are iron. I guess so, agreed Mason, rising. God's luck be with you. It generally is, said the Jerusalem man. From where he sat he could see the sun slowly ascending the heavens. It looked to be a beautiful day. A man could not choose a more beautiful day to die. One by one the children returned, and Shano gave them each a coin, asked them where they had taken the notices, and what had been the response. In most cases the recipients had read them aloud to the gathering, but in one instance a man had read out the notice and then torn it to pieces. The crowd had laughed, the boy told Shanna. Describe the place. The boy did so. And did you see men with guns there? Yeah. One was sitting by a window with a long rifle aimed at the street. There were two others on a balcony above and to the right of the door— and I think there was another man hidden by some barrels at the far wall by the bar. You are an observant boy. What is your name? Matthew Fenner, sir. Shano looked into the boy's dark eyes and wondered why he had not seen the resemblance to the martyred farmer. How is your mother? She's been crying a lot. Shano opened the hide pouch in which he kept his coin and counted out twenty pieces. Give these to your mother. Tell her I am sorry. We are not poor, sir, but thank you for the thought, said Matthew. The boy turned and walked from the room. It was almost noon. Shanno returned the coin to his pouch and stood. He left the traveller's rest by the back door and stepped swiftly into the alley, moving to his right with his gun poised. The alley was deserted. He walked along behind the buildings until he came to the side of the gambling house the boy had described. It was run by a man named Zeb Maddox, and Mason had told him Maddox was a fast man with a pistol. Damn near as sudden as Steiner. Don't give him no second chances, Shano. The Jerusalem man paused outside a tiny service door to the rear, took a deep breath, and then eased open the latch. Stepping inside, he saw the back of a man who was kneeling behind some barrels. Beyond him, everyone's eyes were on the front door. Shano moved forward and cracked his pistol against the back of the kneeling man's neck. As he grunted and slid sideways, Shano caught him by the collar and eased him to the floor. Just then someone shouted, "'There's a crowd gathering, Zeb!' 
Shanno watched as a tall, thin man in a black shirt and leather trousers emerged from behind the bar and moved to the door. He was wearing a pistol scabbard of polished leather, which housed a short-barreled gun with a bone handle. From outside came a voice. You men inside, listen to me. This is the parson speaking. We know you're armed and we are ready to give battle to you. But think on this. There are forty men out here, and when we rush the place, the carnage will be terrible. Those we do not kill will be taken to a place of execution and hanged by the neck until dead. I suggest you put down your weapons and walk, in peace, to your horses. We will wait for a few minutes, but if we are forced to storm in, you will all die. We've got to get out of here, Zeb, shouted a man Shannon could not see. I'll not run from a pack of townies, hissed Zeb Maddox. Then run from me, said Shano, moving forward with pistol raised. Maddox turned slowly. You're going to try to put that pistol in my mouth, Shano, or will you be a man and face me? Oh, I'll face you, said Shano as he strode forward and pushed his pistol into Maddox's belly. Draw your gun and cock it. What the hell is this? Do it. Now put it against my stomach. Maddox did so. Fine. There's your chance. I'll count to three, and we'll both pull the triggers, whispered Shano coldly. You're crazy. We'll both die for sure. One, said Shano. Oh, this is mad, Shano. Maddox's eyes were wide with terror. Two. No! screamed Maddox, hurling away his pistol and throwing himself backwards, his hands over his face. The Jerusalem man looked around at the waiting gunmen. Live or die, he told them. Choose now. Guns clattered to the floor. Shano walked to the doorway and nodded to the parson, and the men gathered with him. Broom was there, and Brisley, and Mason, and Steiner. Beth McAdam was standing beside them, her pistol in her hand. "'I killed no one,' said Shano. "'They're ready to go. Let them ride.' He walked away, his gun hanging at his side. "'Shano!' screamed Beth, and the Jerusalem man spun as Zeb Maddox fired from the doorway. The shell punched Shano from his feet, his vision misting. He returned the fire. Maddox doubled over, then staggered upright, but a volley of shots from the crowd lifted him and hurled him back through the doorway. Shano struggled to his feet and staggered. Blood was dripping to his cheek. He bent to retrieve his hat, and darkness swallowed him. Bright colours were everywhere, hurting his eyes, and blood flowed upon his face. Flames flickered at the edge of his vision, and he saw a terrible beast stalking towards him, holding a rope with which to throttle him. His pistol blazed, and the creature staggered, but came on, blood pouring from its wound. He fired again, and again. Still the beast advanced, until finally it slumped to its knees before him, its taloned claws opening. Why? the beast whispered. Shano looked down and saw that the creature was carrying not a rope, but a bandage. Why did you kill me when I was trying to help you? I'm sorry, whispered Shano. The beast vanished, and he rose and walked to the cave mouth. Hanging in the sky, awesome in its scale, was the sword of God, with around it crosses of many colors, green and white and blue. Below it was a city teeming with life, a huge, circular city, ringed with walls of white stone and a massive moat which boasted a harbour where wooden ships with banks of oars were anchored. A beautiful woman with flame-red hair approached Shano. "'I will help you,' she said. But in her hand was a knife. Shano backed away. "'Leave me alone,' he told her. But she advanced, and the knife came up to sink in his chest. Darkness engulfed him. Then there was the noise of a great roaring, and he awoke. He was sitting in a small seat, surrounded by crystal set in steel. Upon his head was a tight-fitting helmet of leather. Voices whispered in his ear. "'Calling, Tower. This is an emergency. We seem to be off course. We cannot see land. Repeat, we cannot see land.' 
Chano leaned over and looked through the crystal window. Far below he could see the ocean. He glanced back. He was sitting in a metal cross, suspended in the air below the clouds, which flashed by above him with dizzying speed. "'What is your position, flight leader?' came a second voice. "'We are not sure of our position, Tower. We cannot be sure just where we are. We seem to be lost. Assume bearing due west. We don't know which way is west.' Everything is wrong, strange. We can't be sure of any direction. Even the ocean doesn't look as it should. The cross began to tremble violently, and Shano scrabbled at the window. Ahead, the heavens and the sea appeared to merge. All around the window, the sky disappeared, and blackness swamped the cross. Shano screamed. It's all right, Shano. Calm. Stay calm. His eyes opened to see Beth McAdam leaning over him. He tried to move his head, but sickening pain thundered in his temple, and he groaned. Beth laid a cool towel on his brow. You're all right, Shano. You were turning as the bullet struck you. It did not pierce the skull, but it gave you a powerful blow. Rest now. Maddox, he whispered. Dad, we shot him down. The others we hanged. There is a committee now patrolling the town. The brigands have gone. They will return, he said. They always return. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, came another voice. And you, Parson? Yes, answered the man, leaning over him. Take it easy, Shano. All is peaceful. Shano slept without dreams. Chapter 17 I see you have two Bibles, said the parson, sitting by Shano's bedside and holding the leather-covered books. Surely one is enough. Shano, his head bandaged, his left eye swollen and blue, reached out and took the first. I carried this with me for many years, but last year a woman gave me the second. The language is more simple. It likes the majesty but it makes many passages easier to understand. I have no trouble in understanding it, said the parson. Throughout it makes one point. God's law is absolute. Live by it and you prosper, both here and in the afterlife. Defy it and you die. Shano eased himself back into the pillows. He was always wary of men who claimed to understand the Almighty— Yet the parson was good company, by turns witty and philosophical. He had an active mind and was strong on debate. His presence made Shano's enforced rest less galling. "'How goes the church building?' Shano asked. "'My son,' said the parson, grinning, "'it is no less than a miracle. Every day scores of the brethren hurl themselves into work with gusto. You have never seen such spirit.' Could it have anything to do with the committee, parson? Beth tells me that miscreants are now sentenced to work on the church or hang. The parson chuckled. Faith without works is dead. These lucky uh, miscreants are finding God through their labors. And only three were offered the ultimate choice. One proved to be a fine carpenter, and the others are developing like skills. But most of the workers are townspeople. When you're well enough, you must come along and hear one of my sermons. Though I said myself, <laughs> the spirit moves me powerfully at such times. Shanna smiled. Humility, person. I am exceptionally proud of my humility, Shanna, the parson replied. Shanna chuckled. I don't know what to make of you, but I'm glad of your company. I do not understand your confusion, said the parson seriously. I am, as you see me, a servant of the Almighty. I wish to see his plan fulfilled. His plan? Which one? The new Jerusalem, Shano, coming down from heaven in glory. And the secret is here, in the Southlands. Look at the world we see. It is still beautiful, but there is no cohesion. 
We search for God in a hundred different ways in a thousand different places. We must gather together, work together, build together. We must have laws that hold like iron from ocean to ocean. But first we must see a revelation fulfilled. Shanno's unease grew. I thought it had been. Does it not speak of terrible catastrophes, cataclysms that will destroy most of mankind? I am talking about the sword of God, Shano. The Lord sent it to scythe the land like a sickle, yet it has not. And why? Because it is over an unholy place, peopled by the beasts of Satan and the whore of Babylon. I think I'm ahead of you, person said Shano wearily. You seek to destroy the beasts, bring down the whore? Yes. What else should a God-fearing man do, Shano? Do you not wish to see the work of the Lord fulfilled? I do not believe it to be fulfilled by slaughter. The person shook his head, eyes wide with disbelief. How can you of all men say that? Your guns are legendary, and corpses mark the road of your life. I thought you were well read, Shano. Recall you not the cities of I, and the curse of God upon the heathen? Not one man or woman or child was to be left alive among the worshippers of Molech. I've heard this argument before, said Shano, from a hell-born king who worshipped Satan. Where is the talk of love, person? Love is for those of the chosen people, created in the image of Almighty God. He made men, and he made the beasts of the earth. Only Lucifer would have the brazen gall to mould beasts into men. You are swift to judge. Perhaps you are swift to misjudge. The parson rose. You may be right, for I appear to have misjudged you. I thought you a warrior for God— but there is a weakness in your channel, a doubt. The door opened, and Beth entered, carrying a tray on which was some sliced dark bread and cheese and a jug of water. The parson eased his way past her with a friendly smile, but left without farewells. Beth set the tray down and sat at the bedside. Do I sense angry words? she asked. Shanno shrugged. He is a man touched by a dream I do not share. He reached out and took her hand. You've been kind to me, Beth McCarrum, and I am grateful. I understand it was you who went to the parson and got him to form the committee which came to my aid. That was nothing, Shano. The town needed cleaning, and men like Broom would have spent a year debating the ethics of direct action. Yet he was there, I recall. The man doesn't lack courage, just common sense. How's your head? Better. There is little pain. Uh, would you do something for me? Would you fetch me razor and soap? I'll do better than that, Jerusalem man. I'll shave you myself. I'm longing to see what kind of a face you have hidden under that beard. She returned with a stiff badger fur brush and a razor, borrowed from Mason, plus a cake of soap and a bowl of hot water. Shano lay back with his eyes closed as she softened his beard with lather. The razor was cool on his cheek as she expertly scraped away the bristle and hair. At last she wiped his face clean of soap and handed him a towel. He smiled at her. What do you see? You are not unhandsome, Shano, but you'll win no prizes. Now, eat your lunch. I see you this evening. Uh, don't go, Beth. Not just yet. His hand reached up and took her arm. I have to work, Shano. Yes, yes, of course, sir. Forgive me. She stood and backed away, forced a smile, and left. Outside in the corridor she stopped and pictured again the look in his eyes as he asked her to stay. Don't be a fool, Beth, she told herself. Why not? There's an hour before you're expected back. Swinging on her heel, she opened the door once more and stepped inside. Her hand moved to the buttons of her blouse. 
"'Don't you read too much into this, Shano,' she whispered, as she dropped her skirt to the floor and slid into bed beside him. For Beth McAdam, it was a revelation. Afterwards, she lay beside the sleeping Shano, her body warm and wonderfully relaxed. Yet the surprise of his love-making had been in the inexperience he showed, in the passive, grateful manner in which he had received her. Beth was no stranger to the ways of men, and she had enjoyed lovers long before she met and seduced Sean McAdam. She'd learned that there was a great similarity about the actions of the aroused male. He fumbled, he groped, and then he drove himself into a rhythmic frenzy. Not so with Shano. He had opened his arms to her and stroked her shoulders and back. It was she who had made all the moves. For all his awesome powers in dealing with situations of peril, the Jerusalem man was untutored and surprisingly gentle in the arms of a woman. Beth slid from the bed, and Shanna awoke instantly. You going? he asked. Yeah. Did you sleep well? Wonderfully. Will you come back this evening? No, she said firmly. I must see to my children. Thank you, Beth. Don't thank me, she snapped. She dressed swiftly and pushed her fingers through her blonde hair, roughly combing it. At the door she paused. How many women have you slept with, Shano? Two, he answered, without trace of embarrassment. She walked across the street to the Jolly Pilgrim, where Broom was waiting, his face red with anger. You said an hour, Frey McAdam, and it has been two. I have lost customers, and you will lose coin. Whatever you decide, Minir, she said, moving past him to where the dishes waited for cleaning. There were only two customers, and both were finishing their meals. Beth carried the plates to the rear of the eating house and scrubbed them clean with water from the deep well. When she returned, the pilgrim was empty. Broom approached her. I am sorry for losing my temper, he said. I know he is wounded and needs attention. You will keep the coin. I, I was wondering if you would join me at my house this evening. For what purpose, Mynheer? Uh, to talk, have a little meal, get to know one another. It is important for people who work together to understand each other. She looked into his thin face and saw arousal in his eyes. I am afraid not, Mynheer. I am seeing Mynheer Skazy this evening to discuss a business matter. A, a lease of land, I know, he said, and her eyes darkened. Oh, do not misunderstand me, Frey McAdam. Mynheer Skazy spoke to me because I know you. He wishes to be sure of your integrity. I told him I felt you were honest and hard-working. But do you really want the lonely life of a farm widow? I want a home, Mynheer. Yes, yes! She could see him building towards a proposal and headed him off. I must get on with my work, she told him, easing past him to the rear of the building. That evening she was welcomed to Skazy's permanent rooms at the Traveller's Rest by a servant, who led her through to a long room where a log fire blazed in a wide hearth. Skazy rose from a deep, comfortable chair and took her hand, lifting it to his lips. Welcome, madam. Might I offer you some wine? A handsome man. He was even more striking in the light from the fire, his swept-back hair gleaming, his sharp, powerful features almost savage. No, thank you, she said. He led her to a chair, waited as she sat, and then returned to his home. The land you wish to lease is of little use to me. But tell me, Frey McAdam, why you approach me. You will know that no one has title to land. A man takes what he can hold. You could merely have driven your wagon to a spot of your choosing and built a home. Were I rich, Minier, with fifty riders, I would have done just that. But I am not. It remains your land, and if I am troubled, I will come to you for assistance. You have men riding the high pastures, and it is known that brigands rarely trouble you. I hope the same will be true of me. You've learned a great deal in your short time here. 
You're obviously a woman of great intelligence. I find it rare that a woman should combine beauty with wit. How curious! I find exactly the same thing with men. He chuckled. Will you dine with me? I don't think so. Is the price agreed? I will waive the price in return for dinner. Let us be clear, sir. This is a business arrangement. She opened the small bag she carried and counted out thirty silver coins. That is for the first year, and now I must be leaving. I am disappointed," he said, rising with her. "I had great hopes. Hold on to them, Manir. They are all any of us have." After Beth had gone, Shano sat up. He could still smell the perfume of her body on the sheets and feel the after warmth of her presence. Never before had he experienced a phenomenon like her. Donna Tabard had been soft, gentle, and passive, deeply loving and wonderfully comforting. But Beth, there had been with her a power, an almost primordial hunger that had both drained him physically and elevated him emotionally. He eased himself from the bed and stood. For a moment he swayed and the room spun. But he held on, breathing deeply until it passed. He had wanted to dress and walk out into the air, but he knew he was too weak. A child with a short stick could lay him low in this condition. Reluctantly, he returned to his bed. The bread and cheese were still on the tray nearby, and he ate them, discovering to his surprise that he was ravenous. He slept for several hours and awoke refreshed. A light knock came at the door. He hoped it was Beth. Come in," he called. Clem Steiner stepped into view. Now there's a sight," said Steiner, grinning. "The Jerusalem man laid up and shaved. You don't look half as formidable without that silver fork beard, Shano." The young man reversed a chair and sat facing the Jerusalem man. Shano looked into the other's eyes. "What is it you want, Steiner?" "I want something you can't give me." It's something I shall have to take from you, and that's a shame because I like you, Shano. You make more noise than a pig with wind, and you're too damned young to understand it. What I have, whatever it is, is beyond you, boy. It always will be. You only get it when you don't want it, never when you do. Easy for you to say, Shano. Look at you, the most famous man I've ever seen, and who's here to me? You want to see the price of fame, Steiner? Look in my saddlebags: two worn-out shirts, two Bibles, and four pistols. You see a wife anywhere, Steiner? A family? A home? Fame? I wasn't looking for fame, and I wouldn't care a jot if it all left me. And it will, Steiner, because I'll keep traveling, and I'll find a place where they've never heard of the Jerusalem man. You could have been rich," said Steiner. "You could have been like some、uh, king of olden times, but you threw it away, Shano. On you, fame has been wasted. But I know what to do with it. You know nothing, boy. I haven't been called boy in a long time, and I don't like it. I don't like the rain, boy. But there's not much I can do about it. Steiner pushed himself to his feet. You really know how to push a man, don't you, Shano? You really know how to goad. Hungry to kill me, Steiner? Your fame would be sky high. Meet the man who shot Shano in his bed. Steiner relaxed and returned to his seat. I'm learning. I won't shoot you down in the dark, Shano, or in the back. I'll give it to you straight, out on the street, where everyone can see. Exactly, and then what will you do? I'll see you get a great funeral with tall black horses and a fine stone to mark your grave. Then I'll travel, and maybe I'll become a king. Tell me,、uh, why did you pull that stunt with Maddox? You could have blown each other apart. But we didn't, did we? No, he almost killed you. Bad misjudgment, Shano. It's not like what I've heard of you. Has the speed gone? Are you getting old? 
Yes to both questions, answered Shannon. Easing himself up on the pillow, he turned his gaze to the window, ignoring the young man. But Steiner chuckled and reached out to pat Shannon's arm. Time to retire, Shannon. If only they'd let you. The thought has occurred to me. But not for long, I'll bet. What would you do? Grub around on the land, waiting for someone who recognizes you? Waiting for the bullet or the knife? Always staring at the distant hills, wondering if Jerusalem was just beyond the horizon? No, you'll go out with guns blazing on some street or plain or valley. Like they all do, put in Shannon softly. Like we all do, Steiner agreed. But the names live on. History remembers. Sometimes. You ever hear of Pandaric? No. Was he a shootist? He was one of the greatest kings who ever lived. He changed the world, Steiner. He conquered it, and he destroyed it. He brought about the first fall. Now what of it? You've never heard of him. That's how well history remembers. Tell me a name you do remember. Corey Tyler. <laughs> the brigand who built himself a small empire in the north, shot through the head by a woman he'd spurned. Describe him, Steiner. Tell me what he dreamed of. Tell me where he came from. I never saw him. Then what difference does his name make? It's just a sound whispered into the air. In years to come, some other foolish boy may wish to be like Clement Steiner. He will not know either whether you were tall or short, fat or thin, young or old, but he will chant the name like a talisman. Steiner smiled and rose. Uh, maybe so. But I will kill you, Shano. I'll make my own tracks. Chapter 18 New Kazisatra could see something was seriously wrong with the wagon convoy long before he reached it. The sun was up, and yet there was little movement from amongst the twenty-six wagons. A dead body lay close to the convoy, and Nu could see other corpses laid side by side some thirty paces away. He stopped and decided to pass them by, but a voice called out to him from the long grass beside the track, and Nu turned to see a young woman lying in a gully. She was cradling a babe in her arms. Her words were unintelligible, the language coarse and unknown to Nu. Her face was pinched and drawn, and red open sores scarred her cheeks and throat. For a moment Nu drew back in horror. Then he looked into her eyes and saw the fear and the pain. He took his stone and moved to her side. She was terribly thin, and as Nu laid his hand on her shoulder, he could feel the sharpness of her bones beneath the grey woolen dress she wore. As he touched her, the whispered words she spoke became instantly clear to him. Help me. For the sake of God, help me. He touched the stone to her brow, and the sores vanished instantly, as did the hollow dark rings below her large blue eyes. My babe, she said, lifting the tiny bundle towards Nu. I can do nothing, he told her sadly, staring at the corpse. A terrible moaning cry came from the woman, and she hugged the child to her. Nu stood and helped her to her feet, leading her back to the wagons. Some twenty paces ahead on the road, a man was lying on his back, dead eyes staring up at the sky. They passed him by. As they entered the camp, an elderly woman with iron-gray hair ran towards him. "'Get back!' she shouted. "'There is plague here!' "'I know,' he told her. "'I... I am a healer.' "'There's nothing more to be done,' said the woman. "'Then she noticed the girl. "'Aller, dear God, Aller, you are well.' "'He couldn't save my baby,' whispered Ella. "'He was too late for my little Mary.' "'What is your name, friend?' asked the woman, taking his arm. "'No, Kazizatra. "'Well, Minir, uh, no. There are more than seventy people bad sicker, and only four of us that are old in the plague at bay. 
I pray to God you are a healer. Nu looked around him. Death was everywhere. Some bodies lay uncovered, flies settling on the still weeping sores, while others had blankets casually tossed over them. Several paces to his right he saw a child's arm protruding from a large section of sackcloth. Moans and cries came from the wagons, and here and there helpers, themselves stricken, staggered from victim to victim, giving aid where they could, helping the sick to drink a little water. Nu swallowed hard as the elderly woman touched his arm. Come, she said. He looked down at her hand and saw the uglier red blotches that stained her lower arm. Taking his stone, he reached out and stroked her hair. God's love, he told her. The sores disappeared. She stared down at her arms, feeling the rush of strength as if she'd just awoken from a deep, refreshing sleep. Thank you, she whispered. God's blessing on you. But come quickly, for there are others in sore need. She led him to a wagon where a woman and four children lay under sweat-soaked blankets. Nu laid the stone on each of them and the fever passed. From wagon to wagon he moved, healing the sick and watching as the black veins in the stone swelled. As dusk came, he'd healed more than thirty of the company. The elderly woman, whose name was Martha, busied herself preparing food for the survivors, and knew was left to himself. Under the moonlight he studied the stone. There was more black than gold now, and, under cover of darkness, he slipped away into the night. He had no choice, he told himself. If ever he was to see Pashad and the children again, he had to leave some power in the stone. But with each step he took, his heart became heavier. At last he sat down under the bright moonlight and prayed. What would you have me do? he asked. What are these people to me? You are the giver of life, the bringer of death. It was you who brought this plague to them. Why can you not take it away? There was no answer, but he recalled his boyhood days in the temple under the great teacher, Rizak. He could see the old man's hooded eyes and his hawk nose, the white straggly beard, and he remembered the story Rizak had told him of heaven and hell. I prayed to the Lord of all things to let me see both paradise and the torment of Belial. And in my vision I saw a door. I opened it, and there, in a great room, was a sumptuous feast placed on a great table. But all the guests were wailing, for the spoons in their hands had long, long handles, and, though they could reach the food, the spoons were too long for them to place it in their mouths and they were cursing God and starving. I closed the door and asked to see paradise. Yet it was the same door that stayed before me. I opened it, and inside was an identical feast, and all the guests had the same long-handled spoons. But they were feeding each other, and praising God in the thousand names known only to the angels. Nu stared up at the moon and thought of Pashad. He sighed and stood. Back at the wagons he moved amongst the sick, healing them all. He laboured long into the night, and at the dawn he stared down at the stone in his hand. It was black now, with not a trace of gold. Martha came and sat beside him, giving him a cup in which was a dark, bitter drink. "'I've heard of them,' she said, "'but I never saw one before. It was a Daniel stone. Is it used up?' "'Yes,' said Nu, dropping it to the ground in front of the fire. "'It saved many lives, Minir Nu, and I thank you for it.' Nu said nothing. He was thinking of Pashad. Beth McAdam was thoughtful and silent as she steered the wagon south over the rolling grasslands towards the wall. The children were sitting on the tailboard squabbling, but the noise passed her by. 
Shanna was making good progress, but still confined to his room at the Traveller's Rest, and the parson had been a frequent caller at their campsite in Tent Town. Now there was Edric Scasey, tall and confident, courteous and gallant. He had taken her to dinner twice and amused her with stories of his upbringing in the far north. They have cities there now, and elected leaders, he had told her. Some of the areas have formed treaties with neighbouring groups, and there was talk last year of a confederation. They won't get together, said Beth. People don't. They'll row over everything and fight over nothing. Don't be too sure, Beth. Mankind cannot grow without organisation. Take the barter coin. That's universally accepted now, no matter which community you enter. Old Jacob Barter, who first stamped the coins, had a dream of one nation. Now it looks as if it has a chance. Just imagine what it would be like if laws were as readily accepted as Barter coin. Wars will just get bigger, she said with certainty. It's the way of things. We need leaders, Beth. Strong men to draw us all together. There's so much we don't know about the past that could help us with the future. So much. The lead oxen stumbled, jerking Beth back to the present, and she hauled on the reins, giving the beast time to recover its footing. She was attracted to Scazy, drawn by his strength, but there was something about him that left her with a vague sense of unease. Like the parson, he had a dangerous, uncertain quality— with Shano, the danger was all on the surface. What you saw was what you got. How much easier life would have been had she found Josiah Broom attractive. But the man was such a blinkered fool. I dread to think of people who look up to men like John Shano, he told her one morning as they waited for the first customers of the day. Loathsome man, a killer and a war-maker of the worst kind. People like him wreck communities, destroy any sense of civilized behavior. He is a cancer in our midst and should be ordered to leave. When has he stolen anything? she countered, holding the anger from her voice. When has he been disrespectful? When? When has he killed a man without first being threatened with death himself? How can you ask such a thing? Did you not see on the night poor Fenner died? when he stood before the crowd, and that man asked him if he thought he could take on all of them. Shano shot him down without warning. The man did not even have a gun in his hand. You'll never understand, Mynheer Broom. I am surprised you've lived this long. If Shano had let the moment pass, they would all have turned on him, and he'd have been shot to pieces. As it was, he held him. He took the initiative. Unlike poor Fenner. I spoke to Shano about him. Did you know Fenner went to Shano for advice? The Jerusalem man told him to give Weber an order and not engage in any conversation. He said that as soon as Weber is allowed to debate, you will lose the moment. Fenner understood this, Mynheer Broom. But he was betrayed by you and all those with you. Now he's dead. How dare you accuse me of betrayal? I went there with Fenner. I did my part. Your part, she hissed. You got him killed and crawled away like a gutless snake. There, there was nothing we could do. Nothing anyone could do. Shano did it. Alone. So don't criticize him to my face. The man's worth ten of you. Get out. You don't work here any more. Out, I say. With her job lost. Beth saw Scazy, who agreed to let her move on to the land immediately. He even offered men to help her with building her home, but she refused him. Now she was almost there. The oxen were tired as they laboured up the last rise before the land she had leased, and she was ready to allow them a breather at the top of the hill. But when they reached it, Beth looked down into the vale and saw five men shaping felled trees into logs. Close by was a roped-off area, which had been stamped out to form a dirt floor of a cabin. Beth's fury rose, and she drew her pistol and stepped down from the wagon, walking back to where her horse was tethered at the rear. 
Telling the children to stay where they were, she rode down where the men were working. As she approached, one of them put down his hatchet and strolled across to her, doffing his leather hat and grinning. "'Morning, Frey. Nice day for it. What with the sun and the breeze?' The pistol came up and the man's smile vanished. "'What the hell are you doing on my land?' she asked him, cocking the pistol. "'Hold up, lady,' he said, lifting his hands. "'Many a skazy asked us to give you a hand with the footings. "'Fell in the trees and such like. "'We've also taken water bearings to see how the land lies.' "'I ask for no help,' she told him, the pistol steady in her hands. "'I don't know nothing about that. "'We ride for many a skazy. "'He says jump. We don't say why. We just jump.' Beth uncocked the pistol and returned it to her scabbard. "'Why did you choose this spot for the cabin?' "'Well,' he said, the smile returning, "'it's got a good range of open ground to front and rear. "'There's water close by, and the front windows will catch the evening sun.' "'You chose well. "'What is your name?' "'They call me Bull, though my name is rightly Ishmael Kovac.' Bull it is, then, she told him. You carry on, or you'll fetch the wagon. Chapter 19 The first tremor hit the city just after dawn. It was no more than an insistent vibration that rattled plates upon shelves, and many slept through it. Others awakened and rose, rubbing sleep from their eyes and wondering if a storm was due. The second tremor came at noon, and Krina was working in the laboratory when it struck. The vibration was stronger now. Books fell from shelves, and she ran to the balcony to see people milling in the streets. A twelve-foot statue toppled near the main square, but no one was hurt. The tremor passed. Oshiri limped into the laboratory. A little excitement, he said, his words more slurred than usual. Yes, said Krina. Have there been quakes before? Once, twelve years ago, he told her. It was not serious, though some farmers lost cattle and there were many stillborn calves. Uh, how is your work progressing? I'll get there, she replied, looking away. He squatted on the mosaic floor and looked up at her. I wonder if we are tackling the problem the right way, he said. What other way is there? If I can find out what causes the genetic structure to regress, I might be able to stop it. That's what I mean, Krina. You are staring into the heart of the problem and you cannot see the whole. I've been looking at the records of the others who have gone through the change before me. All were male, and all under twenty-five years of age. I know that. It is not a great help, she snapped. Bear with me. Almost all the changings were about to be married. You did not know that, did you? No, she admitted. But how is that important? He smiled, but she did not recognize the expression in his swollen, leonine face. Our custom is for the groom to take his lady to the southern mountains, there to pledge his love beneath the sword of the one. Everyone does it. But the women go too, and they are not affected. Yes, he said. I have given great thought to this. I do not understand your science, Krina, but I understand how to solve a problem. First, look for the deviation, and then ask not where is the problem, but where is not the problem. If all the changelings journey to the sword, but the women are unaffected. Then what do the men do that is different? What did Shiran do while you were there? Nothing that I did not, she replied. 
We ate. We drank. We slept. We made love. We came home. Mm, did he not climb to the chaos peak and dive to the waters two hundred feet below? Yes. The custom, as I understand it, is for the men to purify themselves in the water of the golden pool before they pledge themselves. But all men do this, and not all are affected. That is true, he agreed. But some men merely bathe in an easily accessible part of the pool. Others dive from low rocks. But only the most foolhardy climb to the chaos peak and dive. I still do not understand what you are trying to say. Five of the last six changelings climbed that peak. Eleven others who were unaffected only bathed in the pool. That is the deviation. The greatest percentage of changelings come from those who climb the peak. But what of you? You are not in love. You took no one to the sword. No, Krina, I went alone. I climbed the peak, and I dived. Oshiri flew and pledged himself. To what? To love. I was going to ask a woman to accompany me, but I did not know if I would have the courage to dive. So I went alone. Two weeks later, the change began. Krina sat down and stared at the man-beast. I have been a fool, she whispered. Can you come with me, back to the sword? I may not survive the journey as a man, he said. Do you still have the thunder-maker you brought with you? Yes she answered, opening the drawer of her desk and removing the hell-born pistol. Best to bring it with you, Krina. I could never kill you, Asheri. Never! And I believe I could never harm you. But neither of us knows, do we? Shano pulled on his boots and settled his gun scabbards in place at his hips. He was still weaker than he liked, but his strength had almost returned. Beth McAdam had filled his thoughts ever since the afternoon when she had shared his bed. She had not returned to him since then. Shanno sat by the window and recalled the joy of the day. He did not blame her for avoiding him. What did he have to offer? How many women would want to be tied to a man of his reputation? The days of his convalescence had given him a great deal of time for thought. Had his life been a waste? What had he done that would live after him? Yes, he had killed evil men, and it could be argued that in so doing he had saved other innocent lives. Yet he had no sons or daughters to continue his line, and nowhere in this untamed world was he welcome for long. The Jerusalem man, the killer. The Destroyer. Where is love, Shano? he asked himself. He wandered down the stairs, acknowledged Mason's wave, and stepped out into the daylight. The sun was shining in a clear sky, and the breeze was lifting dust from the dried mud of the roadway. Shano crossed the street and made his way to the gunsmith's shop. Groves was not behind his counter, and he walked through the shop and found the man crouching over a workbench. Groves looked up and smiled. You sent me a fair toss, Minier, Jerusalem man. These aren't rimfire cartridges. No, center fire. They have heavy loads. Man needs to shoot straight with such ammunition. A stray bullet could pass through a house wall and kill an occupant sitting quietly in his chair. I tend to shoot straight, said Shannon. Have you completed my order? Is the sky blue? <laughs> of course I have. 
I also made some 500 shells for Minius Casey to the same requirements. It seems his Hellborn pistols arrived without ammunition. Shano paid the man and left his store. A sharp pebble under his foot made him remember how thin were his boots. The town store was across the street, and he bought a new pair of soft leather boots, two white woolen shirts, and a quantity of black powder. As the man was preparing his order, an earth tremor struck the town, and from outside came the sound of screaming. Shano gripped the counter to stop from falling, while all around him the store's wares, pots, pans, knives, sacks of flour, began to tumble from the shelves. As quickly as it had come, the tremor passed. Shano moved back into the bright sunlight. "'Will you look at that?' yelled a man, pointing to the sky. The sun was directly overhead, but way to the south a second sun shone brightly for several seconds before suddenly disappearing. "'You ever seen the like, Shannon? asked Clemsteiner, approaching him. "'Never. What does it mean, do you think?' Shannon shrugged. "'Maybe it was a mirage. I've heard of such things. "'It fair makes your skin crawl. I never heard of a mirage that could cast a shadow.' The storekeeper came out carrying Shano's order. The Jerusalem man thanked him and tucked it under his arm, along with the package he'd taken from Groves. Fixin' to leave us? Steiner asked. Yes. Tomorrow. Then maybe we should complete our business, said the young pistolier. Steiner, you're a foolish boy. And yet I like you. I have no wish to bury you. You understand what I'm saying? Stay clear of me, boy. Build your reputation another way. Before the young man could answer, Shano had walked away, climbing the steps to the traveller's rest. A young woman stood in the doorway with her eyes fixed on something across the street. Easing past her, Shano glanced back to see that she was staring at a black-bearded man sitting on the sidewalk outside the Jolly Pilgrim. He looked up and saw her. His face lost all colour, and he stood and ran back towards Tent Town. Puzzled, Shano studied the woman. She was tall and beautifully dressed in a shimmering skirt of golden yellow. A green shirt was loosely tucked into a wide leather belt, and she wore riding boots of the softest doeskin. Her hair was blonde, streaked with gold, and her eyes sea-green. She turned and saw him looking at her, and for a moment he felt like recoiling under the icy glare she gave him. Instead, he smiled and bowed. Ignoring him, she swept past and approached Mason. "'Is Skazy here?' she asked, her voice low, almost husky. Mason cleared his throat. Uh, "'Not yet, Frey Sharazad. Would you like to wait in his rooms?' "'No.' Tell him we will meet in the usual place. Tonight. She swung on her heel and stalked from the building. A beautiful woman, Shano commented. She makes my hair stand on end, said Mason, grinning. Beats me where she comes from. She rode in yesterday on a stallion that must have been all of eighteen hands. And those clothes? That skirt is a wonder. How do they make it shine so? "'Beats me,' said Shano. "'I'll be leaving tomorrow. What do I owe you?' "'I told you once, Shano, there's no charge, "'and it'll be that way if you ever return. "'I doubt I'll come back, but thanks for the offer.' "'You hear about the healer? "'Came in with the wagons this afternoon?' "'No. "'Seems like the Red Plague hit the convoy, "'and this man walked out of the wilderness with a Daniel stone.' He healed everybody. I'd like to have seen that. <laughs> I've heard of Daniels before, but I've never touched one. You? I've seen them, said Shano. What did he look like, this healer? Big man with the blackest beard you ever saw. Big hands, too, like a fighter. Shano returned to his room and sat once more at the chair by the window. 
The golden-haired woman had been staring with naked hatred at just such a man. He shook his head. Nothing to do with you, Shano. Tomorrow you put Pilgrim's Valley far behind you. Chapter 20 Sharazad sat, seemingly alone, on a flat rock under the moonlight. The day had brought an unexpected pleasure. No Kazizatra was here in this cursed land of barbarians. It had been a source of constant fury that he had escaped from Ad, and the king had been most displeased. Seven of her daggers had been flayed and impaled, and she herself had lost ground in the king's affections. But now, great be the glory of Belial, the shipbuilder was within her reach once more. Her mind wandered back to the man she had seen staring at her in the hovel that passed for a resting place. Something about him disturbed her. He was not handsome, nor yet ugly, but his eyes were striking. A long time ago she had enjoyed a lover with just such eyes. The man had been a gladiator, a superb killer of men. Was that it? Was the barbarian a danger? She heard the rumble of the wagon coming through the trees and wandered to the crest of the hill, gazing down at the two men who drove it. One was young and handsome, the other older and balding. She waited until they came closer, then stepped out into the path. The older man heaved on the reins and applied the clumsy brake. "'Good evening, Frey,' he said, climbing down and stretching his back. "'You sure you want to unload here?' Yes, she said. Just here. Where is Skazy? He couldn't come, said the younger man. I represent him. The name's Steiner. What do I care what your name is, thought Charizard. Unload the wagon and open the first box, she said aloud. Steiner loosened the reins of a saddled horse that was tied to the rear of the wagon and led the beast back a few paces. Then both men struggled with the heavy boxes, man-handling them to the ground. The older man drew a hunting knife and prized open a lid. Sharazad stepped closer and leaned forward, pulling back the greased paper and lifting a short-barreled rifle clear of the box. "'Show me how it works,' she ordered. The older man opened a packet of shells and slid two into the side gate. "'They slide in here.' Up to ten shells. There's a spring keeps the pressure on. You take hold here, he said, gripping a moulded section under the barrel, and pump once. Now there's a shell in the breech and the rifle is cocked. Pull the trigger and pump the action, and the spent shell is ejected, and a fresh one slides home. Ingenious, admitted Charizard. But sadly, after this load, we will need no more. We will make our own. Ain't sad to me, said the man. Don't make no difference to me. Ah, but it does, she said, smiling, and she raised her hand. From the bushes all around them rose a score of daggers, pistols in their hands. Sweet Jesus, what the hell are they? whispered the man as the reptiles moved forward. At the back of the wagon, Clem stood horror-struck as the demonic creatures appeared, then backed away towards his horse. "'Kill them,' ordered Charizard. Clem dived for the ground, rolled, and came up firing. Two of the reptiles were hurled from their feet. More gunfire shattered the night, spurts of dust spitting up around Clem's prone body. His horse panicked and ran, but Clem dived for the saddle, grabbing the pommel as it passed. He was half carried, half dragged into the trees, shells whistling about him. "'Find him,' ordered Charizard, and the six of the reptiles loped away into the darkness. She turned on the older man, who'd stood stock still throughout the battle. Her hand dipped into the pocket of her golden skirt, and she lifted out a small stone, dark red and veined with black. "'Do you know what this is?' she asked. He shook his head. This is the bloodstone. It can do amazing things, but it needs to be fed. Will you feed my bloodstone? Oh, my God, he whispered, backing away as Sharazad drew a silver pistol and stared down at it. 
I am surprised that the greatest minds of Atlantis never discovered such a sweet toy. It is so clean, so lethal, so final. Please, Frey, I have a wife, children. I never harmed you. You offend me, barbarian, merely by being. The pistol came up, and the shell hammered through his heart. He fell to his knees, then toppled to his face. She turned him over with the toe of her boot and laid the bloodstone on his chest. The black veins dwindled to nothing. She sat by the corpse and closed her eyes, concentrating on her victory. An image formed in her mind, and she saw Nu Kazizatra waiting unarmed and ready to be taken. But a dark shadow stood between her and the revenge she desired. The face was blurred, but she focused her concentration, and the shadow became recognizable. It was the man from the Traveler's Rest. Only now his eyes were flames, and in his hands were serpents, sharp-fanged and deadly. Holding the image, she called out to her mentor, and his face appeared in her mind. What troubles you, Shahrazad? Look, Lord, at the image. What does it mean? The eyes of fire mean he is an implacable enemy. The serpents show that in his hands he has power. Is that the renegade prophet behind him? Yes, Lord. He is here, in this strange world. Take him. I want him here before me. You understand, Shahrazad? I do, Lord. But tell me, why are we no longer dealing with Skizzy? I thought their guns would be of more use. I have opened other gates to worlds with infinitely more power. Your barbaric kingdom offers little. You may take ten companies of daggers, if you wish, and blood them on the barbarians. Yes, do it, Shahrazad, if it would bring you pleasure. His face disappeared. Ten companies of daggers? Never had she commanded so many, and yes, it would be good to plan a battle, to hear the thunder of gunfire, the screams of the dying. Perhaps if she did well, she would be given a command of humans, and not these disgusting, scaled creatures from beyond the gates. Lost in her dreams, she ignored the sounds of distant gunfire. Clem Steiner had been hit twice. Blood sweeped from the wound in his chest, and his left leg burned as sweat mixed with the blood at the outer edges of the jagged wound. His horse had been shot from under him, but he'd managed to hit at least one of the creatures giving pursuit. What in the devil's name were they? Clem hauled himself behind a rock and scrabbled further up the wooded hillside. At first he thought the men wearing masks— but now he was not so sure. And they were so fast. They moved across his line of vision with a speed no human could match. Licking his lips, he held his breath, listening hard. He could hear the wind sighing in the leaves above him and the rushing of a mountain stream to his left. A dark shadow moved to his right, and he rolled and fired. The bullet took the reptile under the chin, exiting from the top of its skull, and it fell alongside Clem, its legs twitching. He stared, horror-struck, at the grey, scaled skin and the black leather body armour. The creature's hand had a treble-jointed thumb and three thick fingers. Jesus, God, they're demons, he thought. I'm being hunted by demons. He fought for calm and reloaded his pistol with the last of his shells. Then he gathered up the reptile's weapon and sank back against the rock. The wound in his chest was high, and he hoped it had missed his lung. Of course it has, you fool. You're not coughing blood, are you? But he felt so weak. His eyes closed, but he jerked himself awake. Gotta move. Get safe. He started to crawl, but loss of blood had weakened him terribly, and he made only a few yards before his strength was spent. A rustling movement came from behind him, and he tried to roll, but a booted foot lashed into his side. His gun came up, but was kicked from his hand. Then he felt himself being dragged from the hillside, but all pain passed, and he slid into unconsciousness. 
The pain awoke him, and he found he had been stripped naked and tied to a tree. Four of the reptiles were sitting together in a close circle around the body of the creature he had killed on the hillside. As he watched, one of the others took a serrated knife and cut into the chest of the corpse, ripping open the dead flesh and pulling clear the heart. Clem felt nausea overwhelming him, but he could not tear his eyes from the scene. The reptiles began to chant, their sibilant hissing echoing in the trees. Then the first cut the heart into four pieces, and the others all accepted a portion, which they ate. Then they knelt around the corpse, and each touched his forehead to the body. Finally they rose and turned to face the bound man. Clem looked into their golden, slitted eyes, then down at the serrated knives they all held. No glittering reputation for Clem Steiner. No admiring glances. No treasure would be his, no adoring women. Anger flooded him, and he struggled at the ropes that bit into his flesh as the reptiles advanced. Behold, said a voice, and Clem glanced to his right to see John Shano standing with the sun behind him, his face in silhouette. The voice was low and compelling, and the reptiles stood and stared at the newcomer. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth in fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the heads of the wicked. Then there was silence, as Shano stood calmly, the morning breeze flapping at his long coat. One of the reptiles lowered his knife. He stepped forward, his voice a sibilant hiss. Here, spirit, O oh man. Shano said nothing, and the reptiles gathered together, whispering. Then the leader moved away from them, approaching the Jerusalem man. I can smell your blood, hissed the dagger. You are a man. I am death, Shano replied. You are a truth speaker, said the reptile at last. We have no fear, but we understand much that men do not. You are what you say you are, and your power is felt by us. This day is yours, but other days will dawn. Walk warily, man of death. The leader gestured to the other daggers, then turned on his heel and loped away. Time stood still for Clem, and it seemed that Shano had become a statue. Help me, called the wounded man, and the Jerusalem man walked slowly to the tree and squatted down. Clem looked into his eyes. I owe you my life, he said. You owe me nothing, said Shano. He cut Clem's bonds and plugged the wounds in his chest and leg. Then he helped him dress and led him to the black stallion. There's more of them, Shano. I don't know where they are. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, said the Jerusalem man, lifting Steiner into the saddle. He mounted behind him and rode from the hills. Shahrazad watched as Jacques and his three companions loped into the clearing. She lifted a hand and waved the tall reptile to her. He approached and gave a short bow. You found the man? Yes. And killed him? No, another claimed him. Shahrazad swallowed her anger. Jacques was the leader of these creatures, had been the first of the reptiles to pledge allegiance to the king. Explain yourself, she said. We took him alive, as you said. Then Shadow came, tall warrior, sun at his back. He spoke... Power words. But he was human, yes. Human, yes, Jacques agreed. I go now. Did he fight? What? What happened? 
No fight. He was death, Golden Hair. He was power. We felt it. So you just left him. That is cowardice, Jacques. His wedge-shaped head tilted, and his huge golden eyes bored into her own. That word for humans. We have no fears, golden hair. But it would be wrong to die for nothing. How could you know you would die? You did not try to fight him. You have guns, do you not? Guns, spat Jacques. Loud noises. Kill very far. No honor. We are daggers. This man, this power, he carry guns, but not hold them. You see? I see everything. Gather twenty warriors and hunt him down. I want him. Take him. Do you understand that? Jacques nodded and moved away from her. She did not understand. She would never understand. The death man could have opened fire on them at any time, but instead he spoke words of power. He gave them a choice, life or death, as starkly simple as that. What creature of intelligence would have chosen anything but life? Jacques gazed around at the campsite. His warriors were waiting for his word. He chose twenty and watched them run from the camp. Sharazad summoned him again. Why are you not with them? she asked. I gave him this day, he said, and walked away. He could feel her anger washing over him, sense her longing to put a bullet in his back. He walked to the stream and squatted down, dipping his head under the surface and reveling in the cool quiet of below. When the king of Atlantis led his legions into the jungles, the Rouage were too few to withstand the might of Atlantis. He had journeyed alone to seek out the king. "'Where have you come?' the king asked him, sitting before his battle tent. "'Kill you or serve you,' Jacques answered. "'How will you determine which course of action?' the king inquired. "'It's already done.' The king nodded, his face stretching, baring his teeth. Then show me, he said. Jacques knelt and offered the king his curved dagger. The monarch took it and held the point to Jacques's throat. And now it seems I have two choices. No, said Jacques, only one. The king's mouth opened and a series of barking sounds disturbed the reptile. In the months that followed, he would learn that this sound was laughter, and that it denoted good humour among humans. He rarely heard that sound now from Sharazad, unless something had died. Now, as he lifted his head from the water, a rippling of faint music echoed inside his mind. He answered, the calling. Speak, my brother, my son, his mind answered. A dagger moved from the bushes and crouched low to the ground, his eyes averted from Jacques's face. The music in Jacques's mind hardened, and the language of the rouage flowed in the corridors of his mind. Golden hair wishes to attack the homes of the land humans. Her mind is easy to read, but there are few warriors there, Jacques. Why are we here? Have we offended the king? The king is a great power, my son. But his people fear us. We are now merely playthings for his bedmate. She longs for blood, but we are pledged to the king, and we must obey. The land humans are to die. It is not good, Jacques. The music changed again. Why did the truth speaker not kill us? Were we beneath his talents? You read his thoughts? He did not need to kill us. I do not like this world, Jacques. I wish we could go home. We will never go home, my son. But the king has promised never to reopen the gate. The seed is safe. 
but we are the hostages to that promise. Golden Hair hates us. She will see us all dead. There will be no one to eat our hearts and give us life. And I can no longer feel the souls of my brothers beyond the gates. Nor I. But they are there, and they carry our souls. We cannot die. Golden Hair comes. The reptile climbed to his feet and vanished into the undergrowth. Jacques stood, observing the woman. Her ugliness was nauseating, but he closed his mind to it, concentrating instead on the grossness of the language of man. What you wish? he asked. There is a community close by. I wish to see it destroyed. As you command, he replied. Chapter 21 Shano rode with care, holding the wounded man in place, but stopping often to study his back trail. There was no sign of pursuit as yet, and the Jerusalem man headed higher into the hills, riding across rocky scree that would leave little evidence of his passing. Steiner's chest wound had ceased to bleed, but his trouser leg was drenched with blood, and he'd fallen into a feverish sleep, his head on Shano's shoulder. The mean it, pa! he whispered. I don't mean to do it. I don't hate me, pa. Steiner began to weep, low moans, rhythmic and intense. Shano halted the stallion in a rough circle of boulders high on the hillside overlooking the great wall. Holding on to Steiner, he dismounted, then lowered the unconscious man to the ground. The stallion moved off a few paces and began cropping grass as Shano made up a bed and covered Steiner's upper body with a blanket. Taking needle and thread, he sewed the wounds in the pistolier's leg. The gaping hole at the rear of the thigh caused him concern, for the shell had obviously ricocheted from the bone and broken up, causing a large exit wound. Shano sealed this as best he could, then left Steiner to rest. He walked to the ridge and stared down over the countryside. Far in the distance he could see dark shadows moving, seeking a trail. He knew he and Steiner had a three-hour start, but loaded down with a wounded man, that would mean nothing. He considered riding back to Pilgrim's Valley, but dismissed the idea. It would mean setting a course that would take him across the line of the reptiles, and he didn't feel he could be as lucky a second time. Shano had left the settlement at dawn, but had been drawn to the east by the sound of gunshots. He'd seen the black-clad reptiles dragging Steiner to the tree and stripping his clothes, and he'd watched them eat the heart of their dead comrade. He had never seen the like of them, nor heard of any such creatures. It seemed strange that they should appear in Pilgrim's Valley unheralded. According to local legend, there were beasts beyond the wall that walked like men, but never had he heard them described as scaled. Nor had he heard of any man-beasts who sported weapons, especially the remarkable hell-born pieces. He put the problem from his mind. It did not matter where they came from. They were here now, and had to be faced. Steiner began to weep again in his sleep, and Shano moved across to him, taking his hand. It's all right, boy. You're safe. Sleep easy. But the words did not penetrate, and the weeping continued. Oh, please, Pa. Please, I'm begging you. Sweat coursed on Steiner's face, and his color was not good. Shano added a second blanket and felt the man's pulse. It was erratic and weak. You have two chances, boy, said Shano. Live or die. It's up to you. He's back up the ridge, careful not to skyline himself. To the east the dark shadows were closer now, and Shano counted more than twenty figures moving slowly across the landscape. Far to the west he could see a thin spiral of smoke that could be coming from a campfire. Steiner was in no shape to ride, and Shano did not have the firepower to stop twenty enemies. He scratched at the stubble on his cheek and tried to think the problem through. Steiner's mumbling had faded away, and he went to him. The man was sleeping now, his pulse a little stronger. 
Shano returned to the ridge and waited. How many times had he waited thus, he wondered, while enemies crept upon him. Brigands, war-makers, hunters, hell-born zealots, all had sought to kill the Jerusalem man. He recalled the zealots, frenzied killers whose bloodstones had given them bizarre powers, enabling their spirits to soar and take over the bodies of animals and direct them to their purpose. Once Shano had been attacked by a lion possessed by a zealot, he had fallen from a high cliff and almost drowned in a torrent. Then there were the guardians, with their terrible weapons recreated from the between days, guns that fired hundreds of times per minute, screaming shells that could rip a man to pieces. But none had mastered the Jerusalem man. Pandaric, the ghost king of Atlantis, had told Shano he was Roiland, a special kind of warrior with a god-given sixth sense that warned him of danger. But even with Pendaric's aid, Shano had almost died fighting the Guardian leader, Sorrento. How much longer could his luck hold? Luck, Shano? He glanced at the sky in mute apology. A long time ago, when he was a child, a holy man had told him a story. It was about a man who came to the end of his days, and, looking back, he saw his footprints in the sands of his life— and beside him was a second set, which he knew to be God's. But when the man looked closely, he saw that in the times of his greatest trouble there was only a single set. The man looked at God and asked, Why is it that you left me when my need was greatest? And God replied, I never left you, my son. And when the man asked, Why then was there only one set of footprints? God smiled and replied, "'Because those were the times when I carried you.' Shano grinned, recalling the days in the old schoolhouse with his brother Daniel. Many were the stories told by Mr. Hillel, and always they were uplifting. The figures out on the plain were closer now. Shano could make out the black armor on their chests and the gray, scaled skin of their wedge-shaped faces. He eased himself back from the ridge and tethered the stallion to a rock, then took his spare pistols from the saddlebag and thrust them into his belt. Returning to the ridge, he studied the slope before him, estimating distances between cover and choosing the best fields of fire. He wished Batik was here. The giant Hellborn was a warrior born, fearless and deadly. Together they'd fought their way through a vast stone fortress to free a friend. Batik had journeyed into the city of New Babylon to rescue Donna Tabard and fought the devil himself. Shano needed him now. The leading dagger had found the scent and was waving the others forward. They gathered in a tight bunch some two hundred yards away, then loped towards the ridge. Shano drew his hellborn pistols and cocked them. Just then, a group of four horsemen appeared, coming from the west. They saw the reptiles and reined in, more curious than afraid. One of the reptiles fired, and a man lurched in the saddle. As the other three returned the fire, Shano took the opportunity to roll over the ridge and run to a large boulder halfway down the slope. The shooting continued for several seconds, and he saw a horse go down, the rider lying flat, shielded by the body. The man had a rifle and was coolly sending shot after shot into the reptiles. Five of them were down, and the rest began to run for cover. Shano stepped out into their path with his pistols blazing. Two were swept from their feet. A third fell clutching his throat. The shock of his sudden attack was too much for them, and the survivors turned and ran back over the plain, their speed incredible. Shano waited for several seconds, watching the bodies. One of the downed reptiles suddenly rolled, bringing up a pistol. Shano shot him in the head. Then he walked out to the riders. Two men were dead, a third wounded. The fourth man stood cradling his rifle in his arms. He was sandy-haired, with a wide, friendly face and narrow eyes. Shano recognized him as one of the riders who had been present when he repossessed his horse. "'Very grateful for your assistance, Shano,' said the man, holding out his hand. "'My friends call me Bull.' 
Glad to meet you, Bull, said Shano, ignoring the hand. You arrived at the right time. Hmm, that's a matter of opinion, the rider answered, looking down at his dead comrades. The wounded man was sitting up, clutching his shoulder and cursing. There's another wounded man up on the ridge, said Shano. I suggest you ride into Pilgrim's Valley and have a wagon sent. I'll do that, but looks like there's a storm brewing. I should get him to Fray McAdam's cabin. We finished it yesterday, and at least he'll be under cover and in a bed. Bull gave Shano directions. Then he and the wounded man rode off towards the north. Shano stripped the guns and ammunition from the dead men and walked back to the bodies of the reptiles, crouching to examine them. The eyes were large and protruding, golden in colour, the pupils long and oval like those of cats. Their faces were elongated, the mouths lipless and rimmed with pointed teeth. But what made Shano most uneasy was that they all wore identical body armour, and that reminded him of the Hellborn. These creatures were not individual killers. They were part of an army, and that did not bode well. He gathered their guns and hid them behind a rock. Then, returning to the ridge, he dragged the unconscious Steiner upright and pushed him across the saddle of the stallion. Gathering his blankets, he mounted behind Steiner and rode for Beth McAdam's cabin. When Samuel McAdam walked from the new cabin and saw the man sitting on the ground in the shade of the building, his fear rose and he stepped back a pace, staring at the newcomer. The man was very large, with the blackest beard Samuel had ever seen. He was gazing intently at the distant wall. "'It is a hot day,' the man observed, without turning round. Samuel said nothing. "'I am not a man to fear, child. I carry no weapon, and I am merely sitting here, enjoying the breeze before moving on.' The voice was low, deep, and reassuring. But Beth McAdam's son had been warned many times about trusting strangers. Some, Beth had told him, look fair but feel foul. Others look foul and are foul. Treat them all the same. Keep away from them. But this was difficult, for the man was sitting virtually in the doorway of their house. He had not come in, though, thought Samuel, which at least showed he had good manners. Beth was in the meadow with Mary, the oxen hitched to the plough, the long, arduous work of preparing the soil underway. Samuel wondered if he should just run back through the house and fetch his mother. "'I would appreciate a drink of water,' said the man, pointing to the well dug out by Bull and the others. "'Would it be permissible?' "'Sure,' Samuel replied, happy to be able to grant a favour to an adult— and enjoying the unaccustomed power that came with bestowing a gift. The man stood and walked over to the well, and Samuel saw that his hands were huge and his arms long. He had a swaying walk, like a man unused to solid ground, who feared it might pitch beneath him. He dropped the bucket into the well and hauled it up with ease, dipping the long-handled ladle into it and drinking deeply. Then he walked back slowly and sat watching Samuel. "'I have a son of your age,' he said. "'His name is Japheth. "'He has golden hair, and he, too, is forbidden to talk with strangers. "'Is your father home?' "'He died and went to heaven,' Samuel told him. "'God wanted him. "'Then he must be happy. "'My name is Nu.' Is your mother here? She's working, and she won't want to be disturbed, especially not by no man. She can get awful angry, Meneer Nu. I understand that. In my short time here, I have discovered this to be a violent world. It is pleasant, however, to meet so many people who know of God and his works. Are you a preacher? asked Samuel, squatting down with his back to the wall. I am, after a fashion, I am a shipbuilder, but I am also an elder of the lore of one, and I preach in the temple. Oh, rather, I did. 
Do you know about heaven? Samuel asked, his blue eyes wide. I know a little, though, uh, thankfully, I have not yet been called there. How do you know my dad is happy? Maybe he don't like it there. Maybe he misses us. He can see you, said Nu, and he knows the Great One, God, is looking after you. He always wanted a fine house, said the boy. Do they have fine houses there? Nu settled back and did not notice the blonde woman who moved slowly through the house with a large pistol in her hand. She halted in the shadow of the doorway, listening. When I was a child, I wondered that, and I went to the temple teacher. He told me that the houses of heaven are very special. He says there was a rich woman once who had been very devout, but not very loving to her neighbors. She prayed a lot, but never thought of being kind to others. She died and went to paradise. When she arrived there, she was met by an angel who said he would take her to her new home. They walked near great palaces of marble and gold. Will I live here? she asked. No, the angel replied. They went further to a street of fine houses of stone and cedar wood, but they passed these by, too. At last they came to a street of small houses. Will I live here? she asked. No, replied the angel. They walked on until they came to an ugly piece of ground by a river. Here there were several rotting planks loosely nailed to form two walls and a roof, and a moth-eaten blanket for a bed. Here is your home, said the angel. But this is terrible, the rich woman said. I cannot live here. The angel smiled and said, I am sorry. It was all we were able to build with the materials you sent up. Nu grinned at the perplexed boy. If your father was a kind man, then he has a wonderful house, he said. Samuel smiled. He was kind. He really was. Now you should tell your mother I am here, said Nu, lest she be frightened when she sees me. She's seen you, said Beth McAdam, and a man ain't been born who could frighten me. What's your business here? Nu rose and bowed. I am seeking a way through the wall, and I paused here to drink of your water. I will not stay. Where's your gun? I do not carry weapons. That's a little foolish, said Beth, but it's up to you. You're welcome to stay for a meal. <laughs> I like the story about heaven. It may be nonsense, but I like the sound of it. An earth tremor rippled across the valley, and Beth pitched sideways into the doorframe, dropping a pistol. Samuel screamed and knew, staggered. Then it passed. He bent and picked up the pistol, and Beth's eyes hardened, but he merely handed it to her. Look at that, Mar! Samuel shouted. Two suns were blazing in the sky, and twin shadows forked from the trees around the cabin. For several seconds the brightness remained, then the second sun faded and was gone. Wasn't that wonderful? said Samuel. That was so hot and so bright. It wasn't wonderful, said New softly. Not wonderful at all. Mary came running round the cabin. Did you see it? she yelled, then pulled to a halt as she saw the stranger. We saw it, replied Beth. You and Samuel go into the house and prepare the meal. One extra portion for our guest. His name's Meneer Nu, said Samuel, disappearing into the house. Beth gestured to Nu, and the two of them walked out into the sunshine. What is happening? she asked. I sense you know more about the weird signs than I do. There are things that should not be, he told her. There are powers man should never use. Gateways that should not be opened. There are times of great danger and greater folly. You're the man with the Daniel stone, aren't you? The one who cured the plague? Yes. 
They say the stone was all used up. It was, but it served a fine purpose. God's purpose. I heard talk of him, but I never believed it. How can a stone do magic? I do not know. The Sipstrasi was a gift from heaven. It fell from the sky hundreds of years ago. I spoke to a scholar once who said that the stone was merely an enhancer, that through it the dreams of men could be made real. He claimed that all men have a power of magic, but it is submerged deep in our minds. The Sipstrasi releases that power. I have no idea if that is true, but I know the magic is real. We just saw it in the sky. That is strong magic, said Beth, if it can make another sun. It is not another sun, New told her, and that is why it is dangerous. Chapter 22 Your weapons are terrible indeed, said Nu, as he looked down at the wound in Clem Steiner's chest. Swords can kill, but at least a man must needs face his enemy at close range, risking his own life. But these thunder-makers are barbaric. We are a barbaric people, answered Shano, laying his hand on Steiner's brow. The man was sleeping now, his pulse still weak. You said something about reptiles, Shano, remarked Beth, as the three of them walked back to the large living room. What did you mean? I have not seen anything like them. They wear dark armor and carry hellborn pistols. From what Steiner says, they are led by a woman. He glanced at Nu. I think you know of her, healer. I am no healer. I had magic, but it is gone. And yes, I know of her. She is Sharazad. She was one of the king's concubines. But she has a lust for blood, and he fulfills her desires. The reptiles are known as daggers. They first came to the realm four years ago from beyond the gateway to a world of steaming jungles. They are swift and deadly, and the king has used them in several wars. With sword and knife they are without equal. But these weapons of yours... What is all this about? Kings, snapped Beth. There are no kings here that I ever heard of. You mean beyond the wall? No shook his head, then he smiled. In a way, yes, but also no. There is a city beyond the wall. I grew to manhood there, yet it is not my city. It is hard for me to explain, dear lady, since I do not understand it all myself. The city is called... was called... Ad. It is one of the seven great cities of Atlantis. I was being hunted by the daggers, and I used my... Daniel Stone to escape. It was supposed to bring me to Balacris, another city by the coast. Instead, it brought me here into the future. What do you mean, the future? Beth asked. You're making no sense. I am aware of that, said Nu. But when I left Ad, the city was bordered by the sea, and great triremes sailed on the bays. Yet here the city is landlocked, the statues worn away. That happened, Shano told him softly when the seas swallowed Atlantis twelve thousand years ago. Nu nodded. I guess that. The Lord has granted me a vision of just such an upheaval. I am glad, however, that some understanding of our world survived. How did you hear of it? I've seen Balacris, said Shano. It is a ruined shell, but the buildings survived. And once I met a man called Samuel Archer, who told me of the first fall of the world. But tell me, how many of the daggers are there? I do not know exactly, but there are several legions. Perhaps five thousand? Perhaps less. Shano wandered to a window, looking out over the night. 
I don't know how many are here, he said, but I have a bad feeling. I shall stay outside and keep watch. I'm sorry to bring trouble to your home, Beth, but I think you will be safer with me here. You're welcome here, John. You do what you have to do, and I'll see to Steiner. If he lasts the night, he has a chance. Shano took some dried meat and fruit and walked out onto the hillside beyond the cabin, where he sat beneath a spreading pine and scanned the dark horizon. Somewhere out there the demons were gathering, and a golden-haired woman was dreaming of blood. He shivered and pulled his coat tight around him. Nu joined him at midnight, and the two men sat in comfortable silence beneath the stars. "'Why were they hunting you?' asked Shano at last. "'I preached against the king. I warned the people, or oh, I tried to, that a great doom was about to befall. They did not listen. The king's conquests have led to a great swelling of the treasuries. People are richer now than ever before. So they wanted to kill you? That's always the way with prophets, my friend. Tell me about your god. Not my god, Shano. Just god. The lord Kronos, creator of heaven and earth. One god. And you? What do you believe? For an hour or more the two men discussed their faiths, and were delighted to find great similarities between the two religions. Shano liked the big shipbuilder, and listened as he talked of his family, his gentle wife, Pashad, and his sons, of the ships he had built, and the voyages he had sailed. But when Nu asked about Shano and his life, the Jerusalem man merely smiled, and returned to questions about Atlantis and the distant past. I would like to read your Bible, said Nu. Would that be permissible? Of course. I'm surprised that the ancients of Atlantis speak our language. I'm not sure that we do, Shano. When I first came here, I could not understand a word of it. But when I touched the stone to the brow of a woman in need of healing, all the words became clear inside my head. He chuckled. Perhaps when I return, I will not be able to speak the language of my fathers. Return? You say your world is about to fall. Why would you go back? Pashad is there. I cannot leave her. But you might go back merely to die with her. What would you do, Shano? I will go back, he replied without hesitation. But then I've always been considered less than sane. Nu clapped his hand on Shano's shoulder. Not insanity, Shano. Love, the greatest gift God can bestow. Where will you go from here? South, across the wall. There are signs there in the sky. I'd like to see them. What sort of signs? The sword of God is there, floating in the clouds. Perhaps Jerusalem is close by. Nu fell silent for a while. Then, I will travel with you. I, too, must see these signs. It is said to be a land of great peril. How will it help you to return home? I have no idea, my friend, but the Lord has commanded me to find the sword, and I do not question his will. I can lend you a gun or two. I do not need one. If the Lord has marked me for death, I will die. Your thundermakers will not alter the situation. That is too fatalistic for me, Nu, Shano told him. Trust in God, but keep your pistols cocked. I've found he likes a man who stays ready. Does he talk to you, Shano? Do you hear his voice? No, but I see him in the prairies and on the mountains. I feel his presence in the night breezes. I see his glory in the dawn. We are lucky men, you and I. I spent fifty years learning the thousand names of God known to man, and another thirty absorbing the nine hundred and ninety-nine names known to the prophets. One day I will know the thousand that are sung only by angels. But all this knowledge is as nothing compared with the sense of knowing you describe. Few men experience it. I pity those who do not. 
A shadow flickered out in the valley, and Shano held up his hand for silence. He watched for several minutes, but saw nothing further. I think you should go inside, Nu. I need to be alone. Have I offended you? Not at all. But I need to concentrate, to feel the presence of my enemies. I need all my strength, Nu, and that only happens when I am alone. If you cannot sleep, take one of my Bibles from the saddlebag by the door. I will see you come the dawn. When the man had gone, Shano stood and moved silently into the trees. The shadow could have been a wolf or a dog, a fox or a badger. But equally, it could be a dagger. Shano loosened the guns in their scabbards and waited. Shano remained alert until an hour before sunrise. Then his feeling of unease drifted away, his muscles relaxing. He put his back to a broad pine and slept. Beth McAdam walked out into the early morning light and gazed at the sky. Dawn was always special to her, those few precious minutes when the sky was blue and yet the stars still shone. She glanced up to the wooded hillside and walked towards where Shano slept. He did not hear her approach, and for some minutes she sat down beside him, staring intently at his weather-beaten face. His beard was growing again, silver at the chin, yet his features seemed strangely youthful in sleep. After a while he awoke and saw her. He did not jump or start. He merely smiled lazily. They were out there, he said, but they passed us by. She nodded. You look rested. How long did you sleep? He glanced at the sky. Less than an hour. I do not need much. I've been having curious dreams. I see myself trapped within a crystal dome in a huge cross that hangs in the sky. I'm wearing a leather helmet, and there is a voice in my ear. It is someone called Tower, giving me directions. But I cannot escape or move. He took a deep breath and stretched. Are the children still asleep? Yes, in each other's arms. And Steiner? His pulse is stronger, but he's not yet awake. Do you believe, Nu, that he came from the past? I believe him, Beth. The Daniel Stones are incredibly powerful. I once stood on the wreck of a ship beached on a mountain, but by the power of a great stone it sailed again. They can give a man immortality, cure any disease. Once I ate a honey cake that had been a rock. A Daniel stone reshaped it. I think there is nothing such power cannot achieve. Tell me about it. Shano told her about the Hellborn and their crazed leader, Abaddon, then about the Guardians of the Past and the rebirth of the Titanic. And finally he spoke of the Mother Stone, the colossal Sipstrasi meteorite that had been corrupted by blood and sacrifice. So there are two coins of stones, she said. No, just one. Sipstrasi is the pure power. But the more it is used, the sooner it fades. If fed with blood, it swells again, but it can no longer heal or make food. Also, it affects the mind of the user, bringing with it a lust for pain and violence. The Hellborn all had bloodstones, but their power was drained during the war. How did you survive, John Shano, against such odds? He smiled and pointed to the sky. Who knows? I ask myself that question often, not just about the Hellborn zealots, but about all the perils I have faced. Much is timing, more is luck or the will of God. But I've seen strong men cut down by enemies or disease or accident. When I was young, I had another name. I was John Cade. I met a town tamer called Very Shano, who taught me about people and the ways of evil men. He could stand alone against a mob, and they would turn away from his eyes. But one day a young man, no more than a boy, walked up to him as he was having breakfast. Pleased to meet you, he said, holding out his hand. Very took it.
At the same time, the boy produced a pistol in his left hand and shot Very through the head. When they asked him later why he'd done it, he said he wanted to be remembered. Very was a man to walk the mountains with. He helped people to settle this wild land of ours. The boy? Well, he was remembered. They hanged him and put a marker on his grave that said, Here lies the killer of Very Shano. So you took his name? Why? Shano shrugged. I didn't want to see it die. And also my brother, Daniel, had become a brigand and a killer. I was ashamed. But did not Daniel become a prophet? Did he not fight the Hellborn? Yes, that pleased me. So a man can change, John Shano. He can make a new life for himself. I guess that he can, if he has the strength. But I do not. Beth sat silently for a moment, then she reached out and touched his arm. He did not pull away. You know why I never came back to you? I think so. But if you made the decision to change your life, my hearth would be open to you. He looked away at the far wall and the lands rolling out beyond it. I know, he said sadly. I've always been lonely, Beth. There is an emptiness in my life which has been there ever since my parents were murdered. But look at Steiner. Until yesterday, the boy wanted nothing more than to kill me, to be the man who beat John Shano. How long before some boy comes to me at breakfast and says, Pleased to meet you? Hmm? How long? And could I sit a night at your table, wondering if your children will intercept a bullet meant for me? I do not have that kind of strength, Beth. Change your name, she said. Shave your head, whatever it takes. I traveled with you, and we could build a home somewhere where no one has ever heard of you. He said nothing, but she looked into his eyes and saw the answer. I'm sorry for you, Shano, she whispered. You don't know what you're missing. But I hope you're not fooling yourself. I hope you're not in love with what you are, the Jerusalem man, proud and alone, bane of the wicked. Is there something to that? Do you fear putting aside your reputation and your name? Do you fear anonymity? You are a very astute woman, Beth McAdam. Yes, I fear it. Then you are a weaker man than you know, she said. Most men fear dying. You just fear living. She rose and walked back to the cabin. Chapter 23 Josiah Broom closed the front door of his small house and wandered along the street towards the Jolly Pilgrim. The sun was shining brightly, but Broom did not notice it. For days now he'd been seething over the departure of Beth McAdam and the hurtful, untrue words she had hurled at him like knives. How could she not see? Men like John Shannon were no help to civilization. Violence and despair followed him, giving birth to yet more of the same. Only men of reason could change the world. But how the words stung! She'd called him a fool and a coward. She'd blamed him for Fenner's death. Could you blame a man for a summer storm or a winter flood? It was so unfair. Yes, Fenner would still be alive if they'd walked into Weber's establishment and shot him down. But what would that have achieved? What would it have taught the youngsters of this community, that in certain situations murder was acceptable? He remembered Shano shooting down the man in the street just after he had executed Weber. The man's name had been Lomax. He was a tough, arrogant man, but he'd helped the parson build his church, and he'd worked hard for Minea Scazi to support a wife and two children. Those children were now orphans, who would grow up knowing their father had been gunned down in the street to make a point. Who would blame them if they turned bad? But Beth McAdam did not see that. Broom crossed the street and heard the sounds of gunfire coming from the west. 
More troublemakers, he thought, swinging to see the cause of the disturbance. His jaw dropped open to see hundreds of black-armoured warriors advancing with their guns blazing. Men and women were running and screaming. A shell whistled past Broom, and he ducked instinctively and ran to an alley between two buildings. A man sprinted past. His chest exploded, and he fell face forward in the dirt. Broom turned and cut down the alley, arms pumping. He scaled a fence and ran out over the fields towards the newly built church in the meadow. At the traveller's rest, Mason glanced out of his window to see the reptiles advancing down the main street, killing all in their sights. He swore and took down his hellborn rifle from its rack on the wall. Swiftly, he fed shells into the side gate, then pumped one into the breach. He heard sounds of booted feet on the stairs, and as the door exploded inwards, he swiveled and fired. One reptile hurtled back into the hallway, but several more ran in. Mason's gun jumped in his hands as he pumped shell after shell into them. Then a bullet took him high in the chest, spinning him against the window. Two more shells ripped into his belly, and he plunged out of the window, toppling to the street below. At the gunsmith's shop, Groves grabbed two pistols, but he was shot to death before he could lose a single round. Hundreds of reptiles surged through the town. Here and there men returned their fire but the attack was so sudden there was no organized defense. At the church, the parson had been delivering an impassioned sermon about the whore of Babylon and the beasts beyond the wall. When the sounds of battle reached them, men and women had streamed from the building. The parson pushed his way through them and stared in horror at the flames beginning to spring from the town buildings. Josiah Broom staggered towards the milling crowd. "'Beasts from hell!' he shouted. "'There are thousands of them!' Men began to run, but the parson's voice stopped them cold. "'Brethren, to run is to die!' He looked around at the gathering. More than two hundred people were present, two-thirds of them women and children. The men had left their guns in the front porch. "'Gather your weapons!' he ordered. "'Broom, you and Hendricks lead the women and children to the south.' There are woods there. Find hiding places, and we will join you later. Go now! He swung to the men who gathered rifles and pistols. Follow me, he said, striding off towards the town. For a moment they hesitated. Then, one by one, they joined him. He stopped at the edge of the meadow where a shallow ditch had been built for drainage. Line up here, he said, and do not open fire until I give the word. The fifty-six men who had joined him settled down in the dirt, their weapons held before them. The parson stood, listening to the screams from the town. He would like to have charged in, bringing the vengeance of God on the killers, but he fought down the impulse and waited. A large group of daggers came into sight. Seeing the parson, they lifted their rifles, but just before they fired, he jumped down into the ditch, and the shots whistled harmlessly overhead. Twenty of the reptiles ran across the open ground. No! yelled the parson. A ragged volley swept through them, and only one was left standing. The parson took up a pistol and shot the creature in the head. Scores more of the reptiles came surging through the alleyways. Glancing back, the parson could see Broom and Hendricks leading the women and children to safety, but they were not sufficiently clear to allow the defenders to withdraw. The reptiles charged. There were no screams from them, no terrible battle cries. They ran forward with incredible speed, firing as they came. Three volleys smashed into their ranks, and the charge broke. "'I'm out of ammunition!' shouted one of the men in the ditch. Someone else passed him a handful of shells. The parson glanced to his right and saw more than a hundred reptiles running to outflank them. Just then, Edric Scazy and thirty riders came thundering from the east. The reptiles opened fire, and horses and men fell. Scazy, two pistols in his hand, galloped in amongst the enemy, firing coolly. The surviving riders followed. The carnage was awful, but Scazy and seventeen men made it through to leap from their horses and clamber into the ditch. "'You're a welcome sight, man,' said the parson, thumping Scazy's shoulder. "'Where the hell are they from?' shouted Scazy. "'Beyond the wall, sent by the great whore, 
the parson replied. I think we'd best get out of here, Scazy urged. No, we must protect the women and children. I've sent more than a hundred of them to the south. We must hold these beasts for a while. We can't do it here, parson. It's too easy for them to go round us. I suggest we back off to the church and hold them there. The reptiles charged again. Bullets shredded their ranks, but four got through to leap in among the defenders. Scazy hammered his pistol into a grey-scaled head, then fired at point-blank range into the beast's body. The others were dispatched with knives, but not before they'd killed three of the defenders. "'Fall back in two lines!' shouted the parson. "'Every second man get back thirty paces, then cover the second group!' The ground began to tremble violently. Men were pitched from their feet as a great, jagged crack opened in the meadow, snaking across the front of the ditch like the jaws of a giant beast. In the town, buildings buckled and a second quake scored the earth. The daggers fled towards open ground, the battle forgotten. "'Now's the time, parson,' said Scazy, and the defenders rose and sprinted back across the meadow. Clouds of dust obscured their passing, but the earth opened and two men fell into the depths of a vast pit. The rest managed to reach the church, which was sagging in the centre. The parson stood and watched as the building slowly tore itself apart. "'Back to the woods,' he said. "'The wrath of God is upon us!' Josiah Broom sat and watched as the parson organised the digging of a trench across the north side of the woods. Earth was being thrown up to form a rampart, the labour carried out in grim silence. Without tools, the workers dug into the soft clay with their bare hands, casting nervous eyes to the north for the expected attack. Broom was in a state of shock. He sat grey-faced as people bustled around him. It was all gone. The town was ruined. The community decimated. The survivors, trapped in the woods with no food, no shelter, and precious little ammunition for the few guns they carried. All that remained was to wait for death at the hands of the beasts. Broom blinked back tears. Edric Skezzy had rounded up three horses and had ridden to his own lands where extra rifles were stored. Two men had been sent to outlying farms to warn other settlers of the invasion. Broom cared nothing for any of it. A child approached him and stood with head tilted, staring at him. He looked down at her. What do you want? Are you crying? she asked. Yes, he admitted. Why? The question was so ludicrous that Broom began to giggle. The child laughed with him. But when his eyes filled with tears and racking sobs shook his spare frame, she backed away and ran to the parson. His face streaked with mud, the red-headed preacher moved to Broom's side. "'It does not look good, here," he said. "'You're frightening the children. Now stand like a man and do some work. There's a good fellow.' "'We're all going to die,' whispered Broom through his tears. "'I don't want to die.' Death comes to all men, and then they face the Almighty. Do not be afraid, Minia Broom. It is unlikely that a maker of breakfasts has done much to offend him. The parson put his arm around Broom's shoulder. We are not dead yet, Josiah. Come now, help the men with the ditch. Broom allowed himself to be led to the ramparts. He stared out over the valley. When will they come, do you think? When they are ready said the parson grimly. Work ceased as the sound of a walking horse was heard in the woods behind them. Then they heard the lowing of cattle. Three milk cows were herded into the clearing, their calves beside them. John Shano rode his stallion up to the ditch and stepped down from the saddle. I thought these might be of use, he said. If you slaughter the calves for meat, you'll be able to milk the cows to feed the children. Where did you find them? the parson asked. I heard the shooting this morning and watched your flight. I rode to a farm and cut these from the herd there. The owner was dead with his whole family. We are grateful, Shanu, said the parson. 
Now, if you could come up with around a thousand shells and a couple of hundred rifles, I would kiss your feet. Shano grinned and reached for his saddlebag. These are all the shells I have. They're for hellborn rifles or pistols. But I'll fetch some weapons for you. I hid them yesterday, about four miles from here. Walk with me a ways, said the parson, leading him through the camp. They stopped by a stream and sat. How many of them are there? he asked. As near as I could see, more than a thousand. They are led by a woman. The black whore, the parson hissed. She's not black. She has golden hair, and she looks like an angel, Shano told him. And they are not from beyond the wall. How'd you know that? I just know it. Speaking of the wall, the last earthquake ripped a hole in it. I would think we would have more chance of survival if we can get there and go through it. A few men would then be able to hold the gap, allowing the rest of the community to find a safe camping place. We have around three hundred people here, Shano. Everything they had has been taken from them. We have no food, no spare clothing, no canvas for tents, no shovels, axes, or hammers. Where can we go that is safe? Then what is your plan? Wheat here, hit em hard, and pray for success. I agree with the praying, said Shano. Look, person, I don't know much about warfare on this scale, but I do know that we're not going to beat these reptiles by sitting and waiting for them. You say we need supplies? Axes, hammers, and the like? Then let's get them. And at the same time, let's pick up a few guns. Where? Back in the town. There are still wagons, and there are oxen and horses aplenty wandering the meadows. Not all of the buildings were destroyed, parson. I studied the town through a long glass. Groves' shop still stands. He had powder there and lead for ammunition. Then there's the smithy, and the whole of Tent Town is untouched. But what of the reptiles? They're camped just south of the town. I think they're afraid of another quake. How many men will you need? I'd say uh, a dozen. We'll swing round to the west and come in by night. And you expect to load up wagons and drive them away under the noses of the enemy? I don't know, parson, but it's surely better than sitting here and starving to death. The parson was silent for a while. Then he chuckled and shook his head. Do you ever think of defeat, Shano? Not while I breathe, said the Jerusalem man. You get these people to the hole in the wall. I'll fetch the tools you need and some supplies. Can I choose my own men? If they'll go with you. Shano followed the parson back to the camp and waited as the preacher gathered the men together. When he outlined Shano's plan and called for volunteers, twenty men stepped forward. Shano summoned them all and led them from the gathering to a small clearing where he addressed them. I need only twelve, he said. How many have wives here? Fifteen raised their hands. How many with children? he asked the fifteen. Nine hands went up. The new men get back. The rest gather round, and I'll tell you what we need to do. For over an hour, Shano listed the kinds of supplies they would require and ways to obtain them. Some men offered good advice. Others remained silent, taking it all in. Finally, Shano gave them a warning. No futile heroics. The most important thing is to get the supplies back. If you are attacked and you see friends in trouble, do not, under any circumstances, ride back to help. Now, you will not see me, but I will be close. You will hear a commotion in the enemy camp. That is when you will move. What you gonna do, Shano? asked Bull. I'm going to read to them from the book, said the Jerusalem man. Chapter 24 For two days, Krina had studied the pledgling pool, 
analyzing the crystal-clear water that flowed away beneath the cliffs to underground streams and rivers. She sat now in the shade of the Chaos Peak, a tall, spear-straight tower of jagged rocks and natural platforms from which the more reckless of the Dianai men would dive. Shiran had climbed almost to a point just below the crest of the peak. He would have gone further had the crown of the rock not jutted from the column, creating an overhang no man could negotiate. His dive had been flawless, and Krina remembered him rising from the water with his dark hair gleaming, the light of triumph in his golden eyes. She pushed back the memory. There had to be something in the pool that had affected Shiran's genetic structure. To dive from such a height meant that he would have plunged deep into the water. Perhaps the problem was there. Krina closed her eyes and let her spirit flow over the rocks of the pool and down, down into the darker depths. She knew what she was seeking, some toxic legacy from the between times. Drums of chemical waste, nerve gases, plague germs. The betweeners had rarely given any thought to the future, dumping their hideous, warifying poisons into the depths of the ocean. One theory back at home base had been that the betweeners must have known their time was short. Why else would they poison their rivers and streams, strip away the forests that gave them air, and pollute their own bodies with toxins and carcinogens? but the theory was offered more as a debating point for children than a serious topic for study. Now Krina blanked such thoughts from her mind and drew from her memories everything she'd been taught concerning water, the essence of life. In the between days, it had covered 70.8% of the Earth's surface, but now the figure was 71.3%. Water made up two-thirds of total body weight. Man could survive months without food, but only days without water. Think! Think! Two parts hydrogen to one part oxygen. She honed her concentration, adjusting her focus, shrinking, ever shrinking deeper into the search trance, analyzing the trace elements at the bottom of the pool. One by one, she dismissed them. Reactive silica, magnesium, sodium, potassium, iron, copper, zinc. There were minute traces of lead, but these could not have been harmful unless a person drank around sixty gallons a day for who knew what number of years. She returned to her body and leaned back, exhausted. The sun had moved past the chaos peak, and her naked skin was burning. Moving several yards to her left, she looked around for Oshiri. He was lying asleep in the shade. There was little of humanity left in him, and his voice was almost gone. Not the water. What, then? She glanced up at the sky and the awesome sword of God pointing to the heavens. She shivered. Not that. Her eyes flicked to the peak. Was it something there? Krina stood and stretched, then dressed swiftly and made her way to the base. There were many handholds in the heavily barnacled rock, and she began to climb slowly. Her mind fled back to the last time she had clung to a rock face, almost three years before, when the Titanic had been breached and she'd carried her son Luke from the doomed ghost ship and down the sheer face of the mountain above the ruins of Balacris. Then she had been... Amaziga Archer, widow of Samuel and a teacher to the children of the Guardians. Guardians? All the knowledge of the Betweeners had been held by them for future generations, yet the work had been ruined, corrupted by one man, Sorrento. He had longed to see rebirth, the world back as it was. His patience had worn thin, and he had begun, through the Mother Stone, to manipulate events. He had given bloodstones to a growing nation that became the Hellborn. He had encouraged their warlike tendencies, giving them the secrets of automatic weapons. "'In war,' he said, "'man is at his most inventive. 
All great historical advances have come through the battlefield. With the power of the Motherstone, he had reassembled the wreck of the Titanic as it lay broken upon the mountainside over Atlantis. He had made it home base for the Guardians. But his doom had been sealed when the Hellborn took Donna Tabard as a blood sacrifice, for that alone had led the Jerusalem man to Balacris and the Titanic. Amaziga remembered that awful night when Sorrento used the Mother Stone to duplicate the first voyage. Though the ship remained on the mountain, those on board, under its glittering lights and beautiful saloons, could gaze out on a star-filled sky over a black and shining ocean. But Shano had fought Sorrento in the subterranean cavern of the Mother Stone, killing him and sealing off the power of the stone. The Titanic had once more struck the iceberg, and a sorcerous sea filled the ship, destroying the Guardians and obliterating the knowledge of eons. And Amaziga had climbed down from the wreck and walked away without a backward glance. The Jerusalem man had come to her. "'I'm sorry,' he said. "'I do not know if my actions were right, but they were just. I will lead you to a safe place.' They had parted at a small town hundreds of miles to the north, and Amaziga had journeyed with her son to the lands of the Wall. She climbed higher and glanced down at the shimmering pool below. Her fingers were tired, and she hauled herself onto a ledge to rest. There was nothing harmful here that she could feel. "'You are getting old,' she told herself. She'd lived more than a century, her youth guaranteed by the Sipstrasi carried by the Guardians. But that was gone now, and silver flecks highlighted her tightly curled hair. "'How old are you in real terms, Amaziga?' she asked herself. Thirty-five? Forty? Taking a deep breath, she rose and climbed on. It took her an hour to reach the ledge beneath the peak, and as she scrambled over it, her hand gripped a sharp stone which split the skin of her palm. She cursed and sat with her back to the rock face, heart hammering. She could detect nothing baleful in the rock of the peak. The climb had been a waste of time, and had served only to bring her bitter memories and a painful wound. Settling herself down, preparing her body for the return journey, she thought of jumping to the pool far below, but dismissed the idea. She'd never been comfortable in the water. The sun bathed her, and she felt warm and curiously refreshed. Her pulse slowed. When she lifted her injured hand, ready to apply pressure to stop the bleeding, the cut had disappeared. She rubbed her fingers at the skin, but there was no mark. Reaching out, she picked up the stone with a serrated edge. Blood had stained it. Carefully, she rose to her knees on the narrow ledge and turned to the rock face. Above her, the overhang jutted from the peak, and above that the sword of God and the tiny crosses that surrounded it. She closed her eyes, her spirit flowing into the barnacled stone. Deeper she moved, coming at last to shaped marble, and, beyond that, to a network of golden wire and crystals. She followed the network up to a silver bowl, six feet in diameter. At the centre of this lay a huge Sipstrasi stone with golden threads inches wide. Her eyes snapped open. "'Oh, God!' she whispered. "'Oh, God!' The Chaos Peak was not a natural formation. It had become encrusted as it lay beneath the ocean. It was a tower, and the Sipstrasi stone was still pulsing its power after twelve thousand years. Amaziga gazed down at the sleeping Oshiri and understood. The healing powers of Sipstrasi. There had been no intention of harming the Dianae. The almost mechanical magic of the stone had bathed Shiran and the others. It had repaired them, eliminating the promoter genes and the carefully wrought genetic engineering. It had returned them to a state of perfection. Dear God! 
Amaziga rose and pushed her back to the face, then stared down at Oshiri. Normally, a wielder would need to touch a stone to direct its powers. But with something of this size? Her concentration grew, and far below, Oshiri stirred in his sleep. Pain lanced him, and he roared, his great head snapping at unseen enemies. His body twisted, and he sank back, his new fur shrinking, his limbs straightening. Amaziga pictured him as she remembered him, holding the vision before her eyes. Finally, she relaxed and gazed down at the naked young man lying asleep in the sunshine. Without a moment's hesitation, she stepped forward and dithed, her lithe ebony frame falling like a spear to cleave the water below. She surfaced and swam to the edge, heaving herself up onto the rocks beside Oshiri. Removing her wet clothes, she let the sun dry her skin. Oshiri stirred and opened his golden eyes. Is this a dream? he asked. No, this is the reality dreams are shaped of. You look so young and beautiful. So do you, she told him, smiling. He sat up and gazed in wonder at his bronzed body. Truly, this is no dream. I am returned? Yes. Tell me. Tell me everything. Not yet, she whispered, stroking his face. Not now, Oshiri. Not when I have just dived for you. Clutching her bloodstone to her breast, Shahrazad stepped through the gateway. Her mind swam, her vision blurred with colors more vivid than any she had seen in life. She held herself steady until the whirling movement before her eyes ceased. She had moved from a star-filled night to a bright dawn, and for a moment or two she felt disorientated. The king was sitting by a window, staring out at his armies engaged in their training maneuvers on the far fields. Welcome, he said softly without turning. She dropped to her knees with head bent, golden hair falling over her face. I cannot tell you how wondrous it is to be once more in your presence, lord. The king swung round and smiled broadly. Your flattery is well-timed, he said, for I am not best pleased with you. She looked up into his handsome face, seeing the sunlight glisten on his freshly curled golden beard and the warm, humorous, almost gentle look in his eyes. Fear rose. She was not fooled by his easy manner, nor the apparent lightness of his mood. In what way have I earned your displeasure, great one? she whispered, averting her eyes and staring at the ornate rug on which she knelt. Your attack on the barbarian village, it was badly timed and appallingly led. I took you for a woman with a mind, Shadazad, yet you only attacked from one direction, allowing the enemy room to flee. Where you should have delivered a crushing blow, you merely drove them into the woods to the south, there to plan and prepare a defense. But they cannot defend against us, great one. They are merely barbarians. They have no organization, few weapons, and little skill. That may be so, he agreed. But if you are so bereft of ideas, strategies, and skills, why should I allow you to command? I am not bereft of ideas, Lord, but it was my first engagement. All generals must learn. I will learn. I will do anything to please you. He chuckled and stood. He was tall and well-built, his movements easy and graceful as he raised her to her feet. I know that you will. You always have. That is why I allow you your small pleasures. Before I make love to you, Shahrazad, I want you to see something. It may help you to understand. He lifted a sipstrassy stone from a gold-embroidered pouch at his belt and held it in the air. The far wall vanished, and she found herself gazing down on the dagger encampment. 
Their low, flat leather tents were bunched together on a rocky slope by a stream. There were guards posted all around the camp, and two sentries on the rocky escarpments above. I see nothing amiss, she said. I know. Watch and listen. The wind sighed across the hillside, and the whisper of bats' wings could be heard. Then she caught the sound of lowing cattle. There was nothing else. You still cannot sense it, can you? said the king, laying his hand on her shoulder and unbuckling the straps of her golden breastplate. No, they are natural sounds of the night, are they not? They are not, he said, lifting her breastplate clear and removing the belted dagger at her waist. One of them is out of place. The cattle? Yes. They rarely move at night, Shahrazad. Therefore, they are being driven, and they are moving towards the daggers. A gift, do you think? A peace offering? She could see the herd now, a dark, shifting mass moving slowly across the plain towards the camp. Several of the sentries stopped their pacing to watch them approach. Suddenly, a shot sounded from behind the herd, and a series of hair-raising screams followed. The cattle broke into a run, thundering towards the camp. Shahrazad watched with growing horror as the sentries opened fire on the lead beasts. She saw the bulls fall, but the herd ploughed on. Daggers slithered from their tents and ran, diving into the stream or sprinting up the scree-covered slope. Then the stampeding cattle swept through the camp and were gone. As the dust settled, Shahrazad gazed down on the ruins where some thirty bodies lay crushed and torn. The king's hands moved to her silk tunic, untying the laces and sliding the garment down over her shoulders, but she could not tear her eyes from the carnage. Look and learn, Shahrazad, he whispered, his fingers sliding over the skin of her hips. The scene shifted to a gully some three hundred paces from the camp, where a man was sitting on a tall black horse. The rider leaned back in the saddle and removed his hat. Under the moonlight she could see his features clearly, and remembered the man who had bowed to her in the traveller's rest. One man, Shahrazad, one special man. His name is Shano. He is respected and feared among these barbarians. They call him the Jerusalem Man, for he seeks a mythical city. One man. The camp is nothing, she said, and thirty daggers can be replaced. Still you do not see. Why did he stampede those cattle? Petty revenge? That man is above that. What other reason could there be? You have patrols out. Of course. Where are they now? She scanned the plain. The three patrols, each with twenty warriors, were hurrying back towards the ruined camp. Once more the scene shimmered, and she found herself looking at the town. Of course you searched the town and destroyed anything that might be of use to the enemy. No, I... I did not. You did not think, Shahrazad, that, that is your great crime. She saw the men at work, loading wagons with food, tools, spare rifles from the gunsmith's store, and other weapons still lying beside the dead daggers. The king moved away from her, but she did not know this, for she saw the man Shano riding slowly along the main street, watched him dismount before the gunsmith's store. Hatred surged through her blood like a fever. Can I have the hunters, she asked. I want that man. You can have anything you want, said the king, for I love you. His whip snaked out, lashing across her buttocks. She screamed once, but did not move, and the long day of pain began. The king gazed down on Shahrazad's sleeping form as she lay face down on the white silken sheets with her long legs drawn up to her body. 
She looked like a babe, all innocence and purity, thought the king. He'd whipped her until she'd collapsed, the blood flowing to stain the rug beneath her feet. Then he had healed her. Foolish, foolish woman, he said. A tremor shook the city, but the power of the Sipstrasi motherstone beneath the temple cut in, repairing cracks in the masonry and shielding the inhabitants from the quakes that rippled across the surrounding countryside. The king wandered to the window. Below the palace, beyond the tall marble walls, the people of Ad were moving about their business. Six hundred thousand souls born in the greatest nation the earth had ever seen, or ever would see, he thought. Through the power of the stone from heaven, the king had conquered all the civilized world and opened gates to wonders beyond imagination. Fresh conquests meant little to him now. All that mattered was that his name would ring like a clashing shield down through the ages of history. He smiled. Why should it not? With Sibstrasi he was immortal, and therefore would be ever-present when his continuing story was sung by the bards. A second tremor struck. They were beginning to worry him. They had increased so much of late. Clutching his stone, he closed his eyes and disappeared. He opened them to find himself standing in the same room overlooking an identical view. There were the marble walls, beyond them the city, and the docks silent and waiting. It was, perhaps, his greatest artistic achievement. He had created an exact replica of Ad in a world unpeopled by man. Here there were no earthquakes, only an abundance of deer, elk, and all the other wondrous creatures of nature. Soon he would transfer the inhabitants here and build a new Atlantis where no enemies could ever conquer them, for there would be no other nations. He returned to his room and considered waking Shahrazad for an hour of lovemaking, then dismissed the thought, still angry at her stupidity. He did not mind the deaths of the daggers. The reptiles were merely tools and, as Shahrazad so rightly pointed out, could be replaced with ease. But he hated undisciplined thought. He loathed those who could not see or understand the simplest strategies. Many of his generals dismayed him. They could not comprehend that the object of war was to win, not merely to engage in huge and costly battles with a plethora of heroics on either side. Defeat the enemy from within. First, convince him of the hopelessness of his cause, and then strike him down while he sits demoralized. But in victory, be magnanimous, for a defeated and humiliated enemy will live only for the day when he can be revenged. Blame the war on the defeated leaders and court the people. But did the generals understand? Now a new dawn was beginning for Atlantis. The king had seen a world of flying machines and great wonders. So far the links had been tentative, but soon he would open the gateway wider and send out scouts to learn of the new enemy. His thoughts returned to Shahrazad. The world she had discovered was not worthy of their attention, save for the weapons known as guns. But now they had seen them... They could duplicate them, improve on them. There was nothing there of interest. Yet he would allow Shahrazad to play out her game to the end. There was the faintest glimmer of hope that she would learn something of value. And if she did not, there was always the whip and her deliciously satisfying screams. The man Shano, at least, was of transient interest. The hunters would kill him, of course, but not before he had provided great sport. How many to send? Five would ensure success. One would give Shano a chance. Then let it be three, thought the king. But which three? Magellus must be one, haughty and proud. He needed a tough task. Lindian? Cold, that one, and lethal, not a man to allow him. 
Not a man to allow into your presence with a weapon of any kind. Yes, Lindian. And to complete the mixture, Rodil. He and Megellus hated one another, constantly vying for supremacy. It should be a fascinating mission for them. They had mastered the new guns with rare brilliance. Now it was time to see if they could use them to good purpose against an enemy of great skill. The king lifted his stone and concentrated on Shano's face. The air rippled before him, and he saw the Jerusalem man heaving a sack across the back of his saddle. "'You are in great danger, John Shano,' said the king. "'Best to be on your guard.' Shano swung as the eerie voice filled his mind. His gun swept up, but there was no target in sight. The sound of mocking laughter drifted away into echoes. Chapter 25 The withdrawal took place just after dawn. The parson and twenty of the men moved out to flank the straggling column as it headed across the valley towards the great gash the quake had ripped into the ancient wall. The parson carried a short-barreled rifle, his pistols jutting from the belt of his black cassock. The rescued wagons carried some of the children, but most of the three hundred survivors of the raid, reinforced by farmers and settlers from outlying regions, walked in silence, casting nervous glances around them. Everyone expected the reptiles to attack, and the parson had been hard-pressed to convince the refugees of the need to move from the seeming sanctuary of the woods. Edric Skezi had returned in the night with two wagons loaded with food and spare guns. He had volunteered with thirty others to man the defensive trench in the woods. "'This is partly my fault,' he had told the parson before the column moved out. "'Those demons are carrying guns I supplied. My God forgive me.' He has a habit of forgiving people, the parson assured him. As he walked, the parson prayed earnestly. Lord, as you saw your chosen people from the clutches of the Egyptians, so be with us now as we walk across the valley of the shadow. And be with us when we enter the realm of the great Hur, who, with your blessing, I will cut down and destroy, with all the beasts of hell over whom she reigns. The wagons were raising dust, and the parson ran back to the column, organizing children to scatter water around the wheels. In the distance, the wall loomed, but if they were found here, there would be no defense. He loped back to the flanking men. "'You see anything?' he asked Bull. "'Not a movement, parson, but I feel like I'm sitting on the anvil with a hammer over me. Know what I mean? <laughs> if it ain't the reptiles, we've still got to walk into the land of the lion men. God will be with us, said the parson, forcing sincerity into his voice. Oh, hope so, muttered the man. Surely do need some edge. Look there, more survivors. The parson followed his gaze and saw a wagon moving down to join them. He recognized Beth McAdam at the reins, a black-bearded man beside her. Waving them into the column, he strode across. "'I am pleased to see you well, Beth,' he said. "'This ain't well, parson. I just built my goddamn house, and now I'm being run out by a bunch of lizards. What's worse, I got a sick man in the back, and this bumping around is doing him no good at all.' "'Within a couple of hours, God willing, we should be behind the wall.' Then we can defend ourselves. Yeah, against the reptiles. What about the other beasts? The parson shrugged. As God wishes. Will you introduce me to your friend? This is new, parson. He hailed the convoy. He's another man of God. Getting to be so I feel hip deep in him. New climbed down from the wagon and stretched. The parson offered his hand, which knew shook, and the two men strolled together. "'Are you new to this country, Meneer?' the parson asked. "'Yes and no,' replied Nu. "'I was here a long time ago. Much has changed.' "'Do you know of the lands beyond the wall?' "'Not much, I am afraid. There is a city there, 
a very old city. It used to be called Ad. There are temples and palaces. It is inhabited now by beasts of the devil, said the parson. Their evil keeps the sword of God trapped in the sky. It is my dream to destroy their evil and release the sword. No said nothing. He'd seen the city in his spirit surge, but there were no signs of beasts or demons. The two men walked together with the flanking gunmen, and soon the parson, tiring of the silence, moved away. Nu strode on, lost in thought. How, he wondered, could a man who professed to believe in the supreme power of God be so convinced that such an awesome power would need his help? Trapped in the sky? What kind of petty creature did this man believe God to be? The convoy moved slowly across the landscape. A horseman came galloping across the valley. The parson and his flankers ran to intercept him. The man was one of Skazy's riders. But I move fast, parson, he said, leaning over the saddle of his lathered mount. There's two groups of the creatures. One is moving on Meneer Skazy in the woods. The second and largest is coming to intercept you. They're not far behind. The parson swung to gauge the distance to the wall. It was over a mile. Ride in and get the wagons moving at speed. Tell everyone to run. The horseman dug his heels into the flanks of his weary horse and cantered down to the leading wagons. Whips cracked and the oxen strained into the traces. The parson gathered his men. We can't hold them, he said, but we'll keep together at the rear of the convoy. When we see them, we can at least slow their advance. Let's go. The morning sun blazed down on them as they ran into the dust cloud left by the fleeing convoy. As the mocking laughter faded, Shano stepped into the saddle. He cast his eyes around the silent street. There in the dust by the traveller's rest lay Mason, his body riddled with bullet holes. Some yards to the left was Boris Haymott, who would now never find the answers to his questions. The crippled hostler lay in the street by the livery stable with an old shotgun in his hands. Elsewhere were the bodies of men, women, and children Shano had never known in life. Yet all must have nurtured their own dreams and ambitions. He turned the stallion's head and rode out into the valley. He'd been lucky at the gunsmith's store. As he had hoped, Groves had made more of the hellborn shells, obviously planning on larger orders from Skazy. Shano now had more than a hundred bullets. He had also gathered a short rifle, three sacks of black powder, and sundry other items from the debris of the general store. As he rode, he thought back to the voice that had whispered in his mind, Be on your guard. When in the last two decades had he not been on his guard or in peril? Neither the voice nor the implied threat worried him unduly. A man lived, a man died. What could frighten a man who understood these truths? For some time Shano rode in sight of the wagons, but there was no pursuit, and he cut his trail at right angles and rode for the hills to the east. If the parson took his advice and moved his people, then the valley would become the place of greatest danger. Shano rode warily, altering direction often, allowing no hidden observer to plot his path. The ground rose, and he guided the stallion up into the boulder-strewn hills, dismounting and tethering him. Then he lifted the sack and opened it, spreading the contents on the ground before him. There were seven clay pots with narrow necks stopped with corks, six packets of small nails, and a coil of fuse wire. He filled each pot with black powder mixed with nails, tamping them down firmly. With a long nail, he pierced each of the corks and fed lengths of fuse wire into them. Satisfied with his handiwork, he returned the pots to the sack and sat down to wait. With his long glass, he studied the valley below. In the far distance, he saw the wagons reach the woods and later watched as the convoy began its slow progress towards the wall. For an hour, he sat and then the first of the daggers came into view, running towards the woods. Shano focused the glass and watched the enemy closing in on the makeshift fortifications. Another movement caught his eye. 
several hundred of the reptiles were running towards the south. A horseman cut across them and thundered away. Shano stood and heaved the sack over the back of his saddle. Taking the reins, he mounted and steered the stallion through the trees towards the eastern slopes. Shielded by the hills, he rode at speed, ignoring the danger of potholes or rocks. The stallion was sure-footed and strong, and he loved to run. Twice Shano was forced to duck under overhanging branches that would have swept him from the saddle, and once the stallion surged over a fallen tree. As the hills leveled out, Shano swung his mount to the west, into a shallow gully that led out onto the plain. Shots whistled by him, and he could see the reptiles closing fast as he leapt from the saddle, dragging the sack with him and pulling one of the pots clear. He struck a match and applied it to the fuse, which crackled and spat. Shano heaved it over the gully edge and then lit another. The explosion was deafening, and red-hot nails screamed overhead. Three more pots sailed into the advancing ranks of the daggers before Shano grabbed the pommel of his saddle and vaulted to the stallion's back. Kicking the beast into a run, he headed him west, glancing back once to see the daggers regrouping. There were many bodies lying on the long grass, but many more were still standing. Shells came close, but the speed of the stallion soon carried the Jerusalem man out of range. Edric Scazy reloaded his rifle. The reptiles had charged the slopes just once, but the withering volley of fire from the defenders had scythed through their ranks. Now they were more cautious, creeping forward and waiting until the defenders skylined themselves. Eleven men were down, and Scazy knew the position was hopeless. He was angry with himself. All of his dreams were ashes now, and all because of the gold supplied by the woman Sharazad. She had first come to him three months before, claiming to be from a community far to the east. Could he get her weapons? Of course he could, if the price was right. And the gold was of spectacular quality. Now he was pinned down in a wood, his silver mine deserted, his town destroyed, the people who would have made him their leader decimated and scattered. He reared up and pumped three shots down the hill before dropping back behind the earthworks. A man to his left screamed and fell, a ghastly wound in his temple. "'We'd best be thinking about leaving,' said another man beside him. "'Seems like a good time,' Scazy agreed." Word was passed along the line, and the eighteen survivors moved back from the ditch into the woods. Shots screamed into them from the trees, and Scazy dived for cover, his wide hat ripped from his head. He rolled into the bushes and sprinted off to the right as shells ricocheted from the trees around him. One struck the butt of his rifle, spinning it from his numbed hand, but he drew his pistol and ran on. A reptile reared up before him with a serrated dagger in its hand, but Scazy triggered the pistol point-blank and the creature fell. Hurdling the body, he ran on. Behind him came the screams of the dying. He looked back once to see the dark, scaled forms of the reptiles were giving chase. He loosed two shots in the direction but hit nothing. Ducking behind a tree, Scazy fed shells into the cylinder of his pistol and waited. "'Get down, Scazy,' came a voice. "'And cover your ears!' A clay pot soared overhead and exploded in the path of the hunters. A second followed it. Scazy dived for the ground as the explosion ripped into the woods, then he was up and running. Shano rode into his path, offering his hand. Scazy swung up behind him, and the stallion cantered away through the woods. They rode for two miles before Shano halted to allow the stallion to rest— its breathing was laboured, its flanks covered with lather. Scazy climbed down and patted the beast. Some horse, Shanna. If you ever feel like selling, I'll buy. With what? asked Shanna, stepping down. All you own is what you're wearing. I'll get it back. Somehow I'll find a way to beat those creatures. And that damn woman. You should be grateful to her, said Shanna. She's surely not a general. With a hundred well-armed, well-mounted men, we could destroy them in a day. Maybe, Scazy agreed, but I'd say she has the upper hand around now, wouldn't you? Shano did not answer, and the two men walked on for some time.
Finally, Shano turned the horse onto a narrow side trail leading up to a cave. The opening was less than four feet wide, but inside the cave itself was huge and almost circular. Shano unsaddled the stallion and rubbed him down. Let's stay here for an hour or two. Then I guess we should find a way to get over the wall. Easier said, Shano. By now those reptiles will be swarming over it like bees on honey. Oh, by the way, thanks for the tiny rescue. I'll pay you back one day. That's an interesting thought, answered Shano, taking his blankets and spreading them for a bed. Wake me in an hour. We could be trapped in here. Shouldn't we move on? It's unlikely they'll hunt for long. Having removed your force, they'll congregate at the wall. And if you're wrong, then we'll both be dead. Wake me in an hour. The Great Wall had been torn asunder by the quake, a huge gash appearing more than twenty feet across. On either side, massive stone blocks hung precariously, looking as if a breath of wind would tumble them down on the rumbling wagons. The parson watched the column inch its perilous way along the stone-strewn pathway. Behind them, the explosions had stopped, as had the headlong advance of the enemy. "'Shannon?' asked Bull, and the parson nodded. "'He don't give up, do he?' With the last wagon through the gap, the parson sent a group of men to scale the wall and lever down the hanging blocks. They crashed to the ground, sending up clouds of dust. "'We shall be able to hold them here for a while,' said Bull. "'Mind you, I think them beasts could climb over anywhere they chose.' "'We'll head south,' said the parson. "'But I'd like you and a dozen others to hold this breach for a day, if you're willing.' Bull chuckled and ran his fingers through his long, sandy hair. "'Given the choice between this and having boils lost, <laughs> I'd surely plump for the knife, parson. "'But I reckon it needs doing. "'Anyways, I think it would be neighbourly to wait for Minnie Scazy and the others.' "'You're a good man, Bull.' I know it, parson, and don't you forget to tell the Almighty. Bull sauntered among the men, choosing those he felt he could trust in a tight spot. They unloaded extra ammunition, filled their water cannons from the barrels on the wagons, and took up positions on the wall or behind fallen blocks to await the enemy. From the north came the sound of gunfire and two more muted explosions. "'He surely does get around,' observed Bull to a young rider named Fed. "'Who? The Jerusalem man. Hope to God he makes it.' "'I hope to God we make it,' said Fed with feeling. "'God damn it! There's that second son again!' The brilliance was overpowering, and Bull shielded his eyes. He felt the rumble beneath his feet. "'Get back from the wall!' he bellowed. Men started to run, then the tremor struck, and they were hurled from their feet. Jagged lines scored the surface of the wall, blocks shifting and falling. A chasm opened across the valley, and a great roaring filled the air, as flames spewed from the pit. "'Son of a bitch!' whispered Bull, as the smell of sulphur blew across him. He pushed himself to his knees. Another massive section of the wall had collapsed, and from out of the dust storm walked a tall reptile, his right hand held before him. Fed leveled his rifle. Hold it, said Bull, and he rose and walked out to meet the beast, halting some three paces short. The creature snorted dust from its slitted nostrils, then fixed Bull with its golden eyes. Speak your mind, said Bull his hand resting on the pistol butt at his side. Yes, speak. This were no good. You, man, much death, no point. You began it. Yes, great stupidity. We only soldiers, you understand. No choices. Now Goldenhair says talk, we talk. 
Who is this golden hair? Sharasad, leader. She says to give us the man new, and we will leave you in peace. Why should we believe her? I don't believe her," said the reptile. "Treacherous woman, but she says speak, so I speak." You tell him mean not to trust your own leader," asked Bull, amazed. "Then why the hell come here in the first place? We are Ruaj, Pa, warriors. We fight good. We lie bad. She say come talk. Tell you words. I tell you words. What answer you? What answer would you give?" The reptile waved his hand.、Mm, "Not for me to say." He snorted once more, then began to cough. "You want some water?" asked Bull. He called Fared over. "Yes." Fared brought a canteen and handed it gingerly to the creature, who lifted it high and poured the cool liquid over his face. Immediately, the dry, scaled skin took on a healthy glow. The reptile handed back the canteen, ignoring Fared.、Mm, very much bad this war, he told Bull. And these, he added, patting the pistol at his hip, no good. Battle should be fought close, daggers and swords. No wind souls from so far. I shark kill twenty six enemies with dagger, face close, touch their eyes with my tongue. Now, bang! Enemy fall. Very much, very bad. You seem like a decent sort," said Bull, aware that the others had gathered close. "I, er,、uh, we have never seen nothing like you before. Shame we got to go on killing one another." Nothing wrong with killing," hissed the creature, "but it must be according to custom. What answer you give, treacherous woman? Tell her we need time to think about it. Why? To discuss it amongst ourselves. You have no leader. What of the red-headed one in black, or the Death Rider?" It's hard to explain. Our leaders need time to discuss it. Then maybe they'll say yes, and maybe no. It should be no," said Shark. "It would lack honour. Better to die than betray a friend. Yet I will take your words to Golden Hair. Water was good. For that gift, I will kill you the right way, with dagger. Thanks," said Bull, grinning. "That's nice to know." Shark bowed stiffly and loped back to the wall. With one leap, he cleared a ten-foot block and was gone. "What the hell did you make of that?" Fared asked. "Oh, damned if I know," answered Bull. "Seemed a reasonable、uh, thing, didn't he?" "You could almost like him," agreed Fared. "We'd better get back to the parson." Tell him about the offer. I don't like the feel of it," said Bull. "No way. Me neither. But my wife and children are with that convoy, and if it comes to a choice between a stranger and them, I know where my vote goes. He saved you and your wife on the trail, Fed. You surely don't go too long on gratitude in your family. That was then. This is now," snapped Fed, swinging away. Chapter Twenty Six. The bodies of the three sacrificial victims were carried from the altars. The high priest lifted the three gleaming bloodstones and placed them in a golden bowl. By the spirit of Belial, by the blood of the innocent, by the law of the king, he chanted, "Let these tokens carry you to victory." The three men remained kneeling as the high priest brought the bowl to them. 
From his jewel-encrusted throne, the king watched the ceremony with little interest. He could see the giant Megellus and feel the warrior's discomfort as he knelt. The king smiled. Beside Megellus, the slender Lindian showed no expression. His grey eyes were hooded, his face a taut mask. On the extreme right, Rodiel waited with eyes closed, mind locked in prayer. All three looked like brothers with their snow-white hair and pale faces. The high priest gave them their stones, then blessed them with the horns of Belial. They rose smoothly and bowed to the king. He acknowledged their obeisance, gestured them to follow him, and strode to his rooms. Once there, he stood by the window and waited as the three warriors entered. Megellus was by far the largest, his black and silver tunic stretched by the enormous muscles of his shoulders and arms. Lindian looked almost boylike beside him. Rodiel moved some paces to the right. Come, invited the king, meet your enemy. He lifted his sipstrasi, the wall shimmered and disappeared, and they saw a man standing beside a tall black horse. Another man was sitting close by. "'That is the victim you seek,' said the king. "'His name is Shano.' "'He is old, sire,' said Megellus. "'Why are the hunters needed?' "'Find him and see,' the king told him. "'But I do not want him killed from ambush or destroyed from distance. "'You will face him.' "'Is it a test, then, father?' asked Rodio. "'It is a test,' the king agreed. "'The man is a warrior, and I suspect he is, as you are, Roiland. His disadvantage is that he was not fed with substrasi strength while he was in the womb, nor tutored, as you have been, by the finest assassins in the empire. Yet still, he is a warrior.' "'Why, three of us, lord?' asked Lindian. "'Would not one suffice?' Most probably. But your enemy is a master of the new weapons. Perhaps you will acquire something from him. To that end, my reward will be great. The hunter who kills him will become satrap of the northern province of Acadie. His companions will receive six talents of silver. The three warriors said nothing, but the king could see their minds working. No unity of purpose now, no combined plan. Each of them was plotting to defeat not only Shano, but each other. Are there no questions, my children? None, father, volunteered Magellus. It will be as you say. I will watch your progress with interest. The three having bowed and left the room, the king sealed the chamber with his stone and settled back on a silk-covered divan. The wall shimmered once more, and he gazed down on the land of the wall. At last Shahrazad had begun to think. She'd laid the seed of division within the enemy, and was moving her troops to encircle them. He looked further into the heavily wooded hills to the west of the refugees. Then he chuckled. Oh, Shahrazad, if only I could tire of your beauty— Yet again you conspire to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. He touched the stone and viewed the lands to the south. His body arched upright as he saw the distant city. As he stood, his pale eyes widening, his mouth was dry, and for the first time in decades a lance of fear smote him. What demonic trickery is this? he whispered aloud. Leaving the image shimmering, he summoned his astrologers. There were four men, all appearing to be in their middle twenties. "'Look and tell me what you see,' ordered the king. "'It is the city of Ad,' said the leader, Araxis. "'Bring it closer, Majesty. "'Yes, it is Ad. "'But see the way the statues are worn and the roadways buckle. "'Move further south, Lord. "'Find the tower.' "'But there was no tower, only a barnacle-encrusted peak.' For some time the Atlanteans stared at the sword of God. "'It is baffling, my lord,' said Araxis, "'unless someone copied the city or—' "'Speak!' ordered the king. 
we could be looking at the city as it will one day be. Where is the sea? Where are the ships? The astrologers looked at one another. Show us nightfall, sire, on this world. The king touched his stone, and the astrologers grouped together to study the star-filled sky. We will return to the tower, lord, said Araxes. We will study more closely and report back to you. By midday, Araxes. Meanwhile, send Serpia to me. The king sat lost in thought, staring at the vision before him. He did not notice the arrival of the general Serpiad. The man was squat and powerfully built, wearing golden armor and a jet-black cloak. Not good, sire, he observed, his voice rough and grating, to allow an armed man easy access to your chambers. What? Yes, you are right, my friend. I did not secure the chamber. But my mind was occupied with that, said the king, pointing to the distant city. Serpiat removed his black-plumed helm and approached the vision. He rubbed at his beard. Is it real? All too real. Araxis is returning here at midday, but when he left his face was white, his eyes frightened. It frightens me also. With the Tower Stone we have opened gates to other worlds and conquered them, but this, this is no other world, Serpiat. What have we done? I do not understand, sire. What is it you fear? I fear that, shouted the king. My city, I built it. But where is the ocean, and where am I? You, you are here. You are the king. Yes, yes. Oh, forgive me, Sir Piet. Gather ten legions. I want that city surrounded and taken. All its records... Everything. Capture its people. Question them. But this was to be Shahrazad's realm, was it not? Do I serve under her? Shahrazad is finished. The game is over. Do as I ask and prepare your men. I will open a wide gateway three days from now. The parson listened to the reports of his scouts. The Southland was wide and open. There was evidence of past cultivation and an incredible number of lion tracks on the plain before the city. Several prides had been seen moving in the distance. To the east, he was told, there were other tracks, bigger, showing talon marks of prodigious size. "'Did you see any beasts?' he asked the rider. "'No, sir, nothing unnatural, like. But I've seen some big bears, <laughs> biggest I ever saw, high up in the timber country.' I didn't get too close. They had camped by a lake where the parson ordered trees to be felled and dragged to the lake side, forming three perimeter walls. Within this rough stockade, he allowed tents to be erected and cook fires lit. The people moved through their chores like sleepwalkers. Many of the women had lost husbands in the attack on the town. Other men, who had chosen to go to church on that faithful morning, knew their wives and children had been butchered. All had lost. For some it was only a building, or a tent, or a wagon. For others it was loved ones. Now the survivors were in shock. The parson gathered them together and prayed for the souls of the departed. Then he allocated tasks for the survivors, gathering wood for the fires, helping to erect tents, preparing food, scouting the woods for root crops, tubers, wild onions. In the distance he could see the glistening towers of the Whore's city, and wondered how long it would be before her satanic legions fell upon them. Bull's arrival with Fed was a surprise, yet even more surprising was his news of the meeting with Jacques. "'You spoke with one of the devil's minions,' he said aghast. "'I hope your soul was not burned.' "'I seemed, uh,' Bull shrugged, "'honest at least, parson. "'He warned us to be aware of the woman. "'Don't be a fool, Bull. "'He is a creature of darkness, and he knows nothing of the truth. "'His ways are the ways of deceit. "'If the woman made us an offer, we must regard it as honest.' if only because the demon says otherwise. Now hold there, parson. You didn't speak to him. I did. 
I can't trust what he says. Then the devil has touched your bull, and you're not to be trusted. Oh, that's、uh, it's kind of harsh, parson. Does that mean you'd consider giving up the healer to them creatures? What do we know of him or his connection with them? He could be a killer. He could have brought this doom upon us all. I will pray on it, and then the men will vote. You ride back and keep an eye on the enemy. Don't I get a vote, parson? I will make it for you, bull. I take it you are against any trade. You couldn't be more damn right. I hear what you say. Go now. The parson summoned new to him, and the two walked together on the shores of the lake. Why are these creatures hunting you, Minier? He asked. I spoke against the king in the temple. I warned the people of coming disasters. So then they consider you a traitor. It is not surprising, Minier knew. Are we not told in the Bible to respect the power of kings as they are ordained by God Himself? I am not versed in the lore of your Bible, parson. I follow the law of the One. God spoke to me, and He told me to prophesy. If He was truly with you, Minier, He would have kept you safe from harm. As it is, you fled before the law of your king. As it is, you fled before the law of your king. No true prophet fears the way of kings. Elijah stood against Ahab, Moses against the Pharaohs, Jesus against the Romans. I do not know of Jesus, but I read Shano's Bible concerning Moses, and he did not run away to the desert before returning to save his people. I will not bandy words with you, sir. <clears throat> Tonight the people will decide your fate. My fate is in God's hands, parson, not yours. Indeed, but which God? You know nothing of Jesus, the Son of God. You do not know the Bible. How can you be a man of God? Your deceit is colossal. But it does not fool me, for the Lord has given me the gift of discernment. You will not leave this campsite. I will give orders to see that if you attempt it. You will be confined in chains. Do you understand? I understand only too well. New replied. As the sun set, the parson called the men together and began to address them. But Beth Macadam strode into the circle. What do you want here, Beth? The parson asked. I want to hear the arguments, parson. So do all the women here. Or did you think to exclude us from this meeting of yours? It is written that women should be silent at religious meetings, and it is not fitting that you should question holy law. I don't question holy law, whatever the hell it might be. But two thirds of the people here are women, and we got a point to make. Nobody lives my life or makes decisions for me, and I've sent the souls of men who've tried to hell. Now, you're deciding on the fate of a friend of mine, and by God, I'll have a say in it. We'll have a say in it. Beyond the circle, the women crowded in, and Martha stepped forward, her hair silver in the gathering dusk. You weren't there on the trail, Parson," she said, when Menier knew healed all the people. He had him a Daniel stone, and we all know what one of them is worth. It could have.